So the cameras are rolling, guys. Um, before we start, again, for the benefits of those who are uh, watching in, <laughs> it's all joke, but all two of them, um, I just thought we'd do a quick round of um, introductions um, with uh, members, officers and guests. So if we start at that end. Wendy Barnard, Democratic Services. Paul Harris, Scrutiny. Uh, Debbie Blakeborough, Chair of this committee. Louise Brown, Vice Chair of this committee. Yeah, press the button. Okay. Eve Parkinson, Integrated Services Manager. Bronwyn John, Integrated Project Manager. Sean Miller, Divisional Director, Primary Community Care. Uh, Julie Boothroyd, Chief Officer, Social Care, Safeguarding and Health. Councillor Roger Harris, Chris Onan Ward, Abergavenny, and member of the committee. Oradar, Councillor Martin Broke at M, uh, for Lansdowne in Abergavenny. Philip Diamond, Regional Partnership Team. Sheila Woodhouse, member for Growfield Ward, Abergavenny, and member of this committee. Councillor Jane Pratt, a councillor for Clenethley Hill, Cliddock, and Gilwan, and member of this committee. Uh, good morning, County Councillor Ruth Edwards, elected member for Lentilio Kuseni, and also a member of the Adult Select Committee. Councillor Lisa Dimmock for the Alms Endy, and also a member of this committee. Councillor Paul Pavia, um, Larkfield Ward Chepstow, member of this committee. Councillor David Dovey, <coughs> member for St Kings Mark Ward Chepstow. Good morning, Councillor Tony St Just Ward Caldecott, <coughs> just visiting you today. Uh, thanks for that. I do actually want to welcome uh, David Dovey and Tony Easton. You're not on this committee, but uh, you've made the effort to get here. So obviously, once the committee have asked their questions, I'm happy for you to uh, ask any questions um, if, if, you, if you want to do that. Um, moving on to apologies for absence. I don't think we've got any. We've got a full house here, haven't we? Oh, I see. Popular. Drawing in the crowds there. <laughs> uh, declarations of interest. As and when, yeah. Um, what I would like to do, if that's okay with the committee, is to, um, in terms of to confirm and sign the minutes, to put that further down uh, the agenda so that we can, if you like, crack on to the, the main business of today, if people are all right with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so moving on then um, to item four. And... Uh, Item four came to us uh, because we've requested it as a committee. And as you know, this is, uh, again, it's kind of part two of the conversation or the story we had back in July when we held a special committee meeting for um, Iron Bevan University Health Board to come to us um, because we had concerns about the closure of the dementia ward uh, in Chepstow. Um, we, because of the, the pressures of time, we appropriately decided that this would be deferred today so we can give it the, the focus and the time that actually it needs and deserves. Um, so um, Bronwyn and Sean promised to come back and they've kept their promise because they're here, so welcome and, and thank you for coming back. Um, now, the present, oops. Sorry, I think I should have declared an interest. My brother's a professor of medicine and does lecture, and I didn't mention it at the beginning. I'm sorry. Thanks. Just fill in the paperwork. Thanks for that. Um, now, the presentation um, is really looking at the steps forward, and it's starting to provide the picture of the future direction of work uh, with integrated <coughs> partnership working with health and social care work together. It links into the care closer to home, and I guess it starts to look at um, what Chepstow Community Hospital is and what it's looking to become. So it's the start of that conversation, I think. It also links in with uh, the use of the 200,000 um, settlement um, that we received on losing um, the dementia ward. 
So that discussion was in the past. We are now looking forward in the future with this presentation. Now, we haven't had any information um, in preparation of this um, presentation, um, but to give an idea of what the purpose of this meeting is and, and the kind of things that we should be looking at as a committee, the purpose ultimately is to update us on the position of the integrated partnership work. Um, and I guess we are needing to, one, consider if this presentation should go to full council to inform all members, so that's something to think about, to consider whether we want this to come back at some point for a progress report against set outcomes. So that's something uh, to look at. Um, our scrutiny, as you know, is about seeking clarity, but it's also about um, giving us the opportunity to, to offer officers um, uh, challenge and support. So that's kind of our role and that's what this is all about. I guess for us at the end of this, we need to feel confident that the right services are delivered by the right people at the right time and that Monmouthshire residents are getting value for money from this. I guess that's our focus. And the right place. Thank you, Ruth. Yes, right service um, to the, uh, by the right people at the right time at the right place. Excellent. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so if I can now hand over to um, Julie. Uh, to give an introduction before the presentation. It's some idea of how long the presentation will be as well, thanks. Morning, everyone. I just thought it'd be useful to just, before we start, um, set this uh, presentation in the context of our ongoing integrated working that we have in Monmouthshire and have had for some time. I'm sort of looking to my left and looking at Eve Parkinson, who um, works across health and social care and has worked um, on some of the projects that lead us to where we are today. Um, thinking back to about 2008, 2009, when we integrated our occupational therapy service, which led us into the whole reablement infrastructure that we have today. I think also, uh, again, I. Bronwyn and, and Sean I've known for many, many years, and we've had a partnership arrangement in Monmouthshire that I think is very, very well developed and has served us well. Our Integrated Service Partnership Board, which we'll refer to a little bit later, is very well established and is a, is a key bit of our uh, infrastructure for our joint coming together and working out how we're going to provide services across health and social care in Monmouthshire. It's, incre it, it's, it's been working very, very well. I think it's fair to say that from a Monmouthshire perspective, and Sean and Bron will be able to, to, to refer to this, I think it, we're, we're, we're way ahead in terms of the way in which we deliver our integrated offer. <coughs> and the way that we have constituted our teams, which we're going to refer to in a little bit in the presentation, the way that we deliver in a what is called a seamless way, that we, we try really hard to make sure that when somebody touches our provision, they touch it once. So you're not handed around many, many different service offers. And certainly I've sat here and discussed that in different iterations over, uh, over a number of years. I think this presentation um, is, is, a, is, a, is a really interesting point in our, in our development um, because it really firmly places Chepstow Community Hospital uh, which we see as part of our integrated hub work and always have. It's always been there. It's, you know, I think over the last few years, and I think Bronwyn particularly, has strove very, very hard to raise the profile of Chepstow Community Hospital in the health board arena to really look at how does it fit with the clinical futures work and the, the development of the Grange Hospital? How does it fit with the integrated working that we've already got in Monmouthshire? And how do we really make sure that that motors ahead together? Bearing in mind, we have two other hubs. and In fact, we have three other hubs now, but we, we, we talk about the big hubs and the sub-hubs. Mardi Park is one of our integrated hubs, and uh, Monovale is another one of our integrated hubs. And then latterly, we have a, a hub that's been developed in Usk, um, again, out of the, the need to have more of a, um, a, a centralised service offer in this bit of the county. So we'll run through the presentation. We're going to take turns in, in, in sharing different bits, but I just wanted to, to sort of say that this isn't, this isn't day one. This, this, this goes back quite a long way. So I just wanted to, to reference that if, if that's helpful. 
Thanks, Julie. That, that's a brilliant introduction. Um, I'm going to just do the first couple of slides for you, which gives some of the background and context to the work that we are doing in Chepstow, because we know the focus today is on Chepstow Hospital, but it does fit in with this wider strategic context, which you will all be, I'm sure, very familiar with, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which really in, it encourages us to look at well-being for our population in terms of all the resources we've got available to us, whether that be health, social care, the natural environment, our resilient communities, the work that you, you people do as well in, 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 your, in your roles. All of us are needed to ensure that people maintain their well-being and that it's not just about the kind of clinical and medical interventions. The Social Services and Wellbeing Act further then puts a requirement on us, particularly between health and social care, to work together as partners in an integrated way and sets up a structure for us to do that. But I do think it's useful to just note, as Julie has just mentioned, we have been doing this in Monmouthshire for a little bit of time, even before these acts came into being. So we feel as if we've already come quite a long way on that journey. A very recent plan that's come out this year, this summer, is A Healthier Wales, our plan for health and social care, which has come out of, of Welsh Government in response to a parliamentary review about the long-term future for health and social care in Wales. And this plan really directs and highlights how we should um, implement integrated models of care that, uh, that is in keeping with those acts, that enables us to work according to those acts' principles to improve the well-being and health of our population, um, and highlighting the need for integrated working and integrated teams around places, around communities and neighbourhoods, and about us concentrating on that and pulling our resources together more around those neighbourhoods. And then there's a mention of the Care Closer to Home strategy, which is local work that we've done. It was across Gwent, but it was particularly powerful in Monmouthshire, I must say. And this is our plan for integrated working. And again, that had focused two years ago on place-based integrated teams. Um, and looking at new ways of providing services, new ways of primary care and how GP surgeries work. And again, I was just going to iterate that Monmouthshire, local authority, particularly social services, and the health board have a very close, integrated working relationships, a good joint plan, and already well-established integrated teams. The next slide I'm going to quickly just mention, because through the Social Services and Wellbeing Act, we needed to establish a regional partnership board structure. And you can see there the regional partnership board, um, which covers the Gwent area. It has got Penny Jones, the cabinet lead from Monmouthshire, sits on that regional partnership board. And it looks a very busy slide. But down there at the bottom, right in the middle, is our Monmouthshire Integrated Partnership Board. And so that shows the, the, the line of governance right up to the Regional Partnership Board and shows how we are in keeping with that infrastructure that's come in as part of the Social Services and Wellbeing Act. And that Monmouthshire Integrated Partnership Board has been running for a long time and is very mature and is a robust way in which we combine and work together in Monmouthshire. All of the acts and the strategy talks about the need to integrate our well-being networks. It talks about a transformational model um, for our primary and community care. This is about the model focusing on the place-based care I've mentioned, with services operating on a local population basis, trying to build up as best we can resilient communities, using the wealth of resource we have in our communities, in um, our networks, to ensure that GPs are linked into that too. Because very often, the answer to many of the people's problems lie in those low-level social interactions. We know we have problems with social exclusion. We know we have problems with loneliness. We know that we have lots of problems that impact on people's well-being and that we can, if we work together in a more joined up, integrated way, be able to offer, offer, offer services that are much more appropriate for people to help to sustain their well-being. 
specialist expertise will be at a wider level because we don't need those down at every neighbourhood level. They will be available at a wider level. So the model requires that we develop hubs, both physical and virtual, at key locations. And you will see further on in this presentation where they are within Monmouthshire and how we've done that to support the place-based working and to make sure that we've got ease of access for our population into services. So in summary, offering integrated opportunities, co-location, which helps that, but also a new model to screen people to those appropriate places within our networks and to offer one front door for people, because we know it can be very confusing for people needing to access care. The next slide just quickly demonstrates that in terms of the Health Board's clinical feature strategy and just notes the, the wider circle there about staying healthy and how we use those wellbeing networks, how we're trying to establish care closer to home. And that means some of the services that currently you might find more in DGHs coming out, if appropriate, to local levels. And that is um, a useful diagram to bear in mind when we think about Chepstow Community Hospital and what we're trying to do there. And then the inner bits of the half circles are much more about the specialist stuff that you need to go elsewhere for where you have a critical mass for, for people to be able to operate. Another model, and I'm sorry you've got lots of pictures and lots of models being thrown at you today, but this just this again, just saying the same kinds of things in a slightly different way. And this is the model you would see more in a healthier Wales. This is a model that's been developed to try and ensure that primary care and community services are fit for the future, that with the pressures on primary care that are being felt around the countryside, with the difficulties in GP recruitment, we are looking at different ways of providing services, signposting people to the most appropriate places, um, you know, the right place, the right time, the right person to provide the care, connects GPs to the wider net networks, and makes sure that we are able to offer that integrated whole system approach. Back to me and the frog spawn. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, picture, I think it's fair to say. It, it, I'll, I'll give some description to this. For some time now in Monmouthshire, as part of our integrated working, what we've recognised is that when people come towards the social services door, often it's not for the things that we've got behind that social services door. And we carried out, for members who've been around a long time, uh, will remember um, probably in the last cycle, we had a, a pilot project uh, called Community Connection, Local Area Coordination. And we employed two people who pioneered this approach, which is about getting into local communities, really trying to connect people to what was there. Within six months of that project, what we learned was that those two individuals were actually being represented through a myriad of other organisations. So all of the colours that you can see on that chart actually represent different organisations, different funding streams and different partners who are all trying to deliver well-being in communities. So what we um, have done over the last couple of years is develop a network of those individual um, people and organisations to come together to actually say if we're all providing and supporting people in Monmouthshire at a number of different levels around well-being, how can we make sure that we in a sense become more of a team Monmouthshire? So interestingly enough I'm supposed to be somewhere else as well today which is we're evidencing that at the moment through a piece of research um, where we're looking at what has been the impact of that. We're a couple of years into it. Has there been impacts for individuals and organisations that is helping progress this forward? I would describe this as our early intervention work and really builds around the social inclusion model. It's about identifying people as soon as we possibly can who require support, but require support from a range of agencies. So within that frog spawn as we, we refer to it. You have uh, services funded through um, uh, reg um, RSLs, through our housing partners. You've got supporting people. You've got early intervention mental health services. You've got museums. You've got a, a myriad of people who are delivering well-being support or services. And our task has been to really try to coordinate that activity and look at how we can best 
develop that. Now, when we started, that frog spawn picture was a lot smaller. It has grown and grown and grown as we've developed that network. And I think it's been a very important strand of what, what, we, what we're doing. And obviously, it'll be something that we'll want to bring back to select in terms of the evidence research that we're doing at the moment, that we're partnered with at Swansea University. So it'd be useful to bring that back. Because one of the key questions for us has been, we like getting together because we like each other and we all get on well and we're all doing lovely things, but is it adding value and is it actually making a difference? And I'm hoping that that evidence base will support that and we'll, we'll look to, to develop that further. Sorry. Reference has already been made to the infrastructure of buildings that we have. Um, I think they've all been mentioned, apart from uh, the development of Caldicott Health Centre as a sub-hub of Chepstow. Um, it's a little bit behind the development of, of USK. The reason for that is that we actually are trying to pilot some new models for children and families in USK, and we haven't quite got to the point yet where there's clarity about how that's actually going to be achieved within that centre and we are going to need to make some alterations to the building so we're on the case at the moment with progressing Caldicott but the others as as it says there we've got an infrastructure of buildings which lend themselves to and have already started to be used as health and well-being hubs in the different geographical parts of Monmouthshire. Um, at the moment, I've just given you a list here of where people actually are. This is where health and social care staff are based. Um, in addition to the hubs, there's staff in quite a few other places in Monmouthshire. <coughs> and what we would ultimately like to do is to try to have the hubs as the centres for all integrated working. So we are working collectively to try to make sure that we've got joined up teams across each of the hubs. Um, just another bit of background information. This just tells you um, what the practices are in, in Monmouthshire. We've got 13 G pra GP practices across the whole of the population, approximately 200,000. Um, there are eight practices in the north, um, and the neighbourhood care network lead there is Dr Brian Harries from uh, Dixton Road Surgery in Monmouth. Uh, there are five practices in the south, um, and the south Monmouthshire Monmouthshire Neighbourhood Care Network lead is Dr Andy Gray, who's from Caldicott Health Centre. L other locally accessible services, there's a massive list here of what else is out there. Um, the services offered by the community pharmacies, it would be interesting really to ask you whether you know what's actually available from your local pharmacy. I don't know if anybody has really sort of thought about that but it's it's worth mentioning that all the all the gp uh, all the pharmacies the community pharmacies in monmouthshire of which there are 17 uh offer a common ailment service it, that's something that's not perhaps been as well advertised yet as as it could be and will be because that offers a very quick to access service for professional advice for people suffering from 17 common ailments um i think it's 17 isn't it yeah. i think that's right Don't ask me to name them yeah <laughs> <laughs> um and we are going to be doing a, a campaign within the health board to actually get that information out there to people and the other things that are that are in italics there are also things which are offered from um pharmacies so it's something we need to actually promote a bit more than we do now um, the next one is something that was um, requested, I think, by the committee, was information about what's currently available at Chepstow Hospital. Um, we've got 32 community beds, which are run over two ward areas that run as an integrated unit. Um, we've got an X-ray and ultrasound unit, physiotherapy, inpatient, outpatient community services, occupational therapy, inpatient, outpatient community services, a comprehensive older adult mental health service with a CMHT-based dementia assessment service, clinics and community services with consultant medical staff based in the hospital. Um, a range of patient education and support groups run from the hospital. 
Um, we also, at the moment, offer facilities for external groups to provide patient support. Um, a large range of outpatient services providing both consultant-led clinics coming out from secondary care from the Royal Gwent Neville Hall um, and also community-based clinics, so specialist nurse clinics. Um, we've got a GP who's providing a um, musculoskeletal clinic for people with back pain. We've got all sorts of different clinics happening. Um, and we also provide the midwifery and health visiting uh, base for South Monmouthshire community staff and a range of health visiting and midwifery clinics take place in the hospital. Um, relating back to um, what Julie mentioned earlier, this next slide describes what the current service model is. Apologies for it being so small. Um, basically, this describes how it all works at local level. So the Neighbourhood Care Network has mapped its assets um, and that actually feeds into the needs assessment that was done for Chepstow as to what services need to be provided at local level and describes to people how that works for them. Apologies for the quality of that slide. That is something we can circulate out to people if you're interested to see a pictorial version of what we're doing. Yeah, it, it, I, when I look at it, it does look a little bit... Just just to see if you've got your um, if you've got your um, computer. Um, sorry, Paula has um, emailed that presentation through to you, so yeah. you can um, uh, look at it on there. Thanks. I think what's happened, if I'm honest, is that when I fitted it to the presentation, it's lost something of the definition of the letters. So we can get you another version of that out. I do apologise for that. Services introduced in Chepstow since 2012, we are aware that there's a perception that Chepstow Hospital has been run down, which is largely related to the fact that the, there are less beds there than there have previously been. But as Julie mentioned, we have been working hard in the background to actually redefine what Chepstow's role is for the future. And there are a range of services that we've actually introduced in the hospital some of which are high volume patient services, so benefit large numbers of people over the last few years. Um, in 2012, I could have gone back further, but that's, we arbitrarily decided 2012 was a good point. Um, the Integrated Services Partnership Board was starting to be very active around that time. And that's when we started to really get um, the bit between our teeth around the future of integration, I think it would be fair to say. So the Integrated Older Adult Community Team was established in 2012 at Chepstow Hospital with staff moving up from Hanbury House and Seven View from the Council, staff from the Health Board moving from various other locations and creating an integrated team base. Um, at the same time, the Older Adult Community Mental Health Team was transferred. They were in Caldicott Health Centre before in a reduced form, but staff were moved down from um, Maindiff Court in Abergavenny as well at the same time, and the, the older adult mental health team base was established. The two teams worked very closely together. Um, the primary care mental health service was established in 2013. Um, that runs from Chepstow and offers um, a range of individual um, interventions through clinic and personal contact and also group work. Um, in 2015, the aortic aneurysm service started from Chepstow. I think we were the first place in Gwent to offer accommodation for that to happen. That's a, a regional screening service for men, which um, reduces the risk of aortic aneurysm by screening and taking appropriate action to stop people having a catastrophic event. Uh, the teledermatology service started in 2015. That's a service provided as an outreach from the Royal Gwent, which prevents patients having to go to Newport for dermatology. It's basically a photography service, which is then dealt with uh, through a um, communication system remotely. Um, also in 2015, um, we've started to provide the um, dementia assessment service and recruited a dementia support worker to actually support that service 
Um, that's that was happening previously only in Main Diff, and that's been dispersed. We're actually looking at the moment at the potential for that to go to Usk as well. Uh, it runs from Montevale, it runs from Abergavenny, runs from Chepstow, and we're, we're looking at Usk as the next potential place for it, which is great for people because it means that they can access it locally, which takes away some of the fear of um, getting a diagnosis. Um, additional phlebotomy and ECG services have been provided from Chepstow. I don't know if people are aware, but previously those who attended an outpatient appointment in Newport had to go to, to Newport to have their bloods taken. That's now available in Chepstow through an outpatient service. And we also offer a local ECG service now, which is new, which we didn't have before. Um, and we've also got an additional rheumatology clinic, which has started in 2017. So there's been quite a lot happening over the last few years. This year, we've really, um, with more clarity about clinical futures and how it's going to actually impact on services at local level, we've really managed to get quite a lot more going on in Chepstow. Um, we're piloting a frailty assessment bed at the moment, which is... Um, a means of people who are on the cusp of needing admission to hospital but whose admission might be prevented by intensive assessment. We're, what we're doing is bringing people into hospital for a few days to enable all that assessment to happen locally rather than them ending up in crisis and having to be admitted into the Royal Gwent. So that's being piloted at the moment. Dr Andy Gray, the NCN lead, is leading that pilot. Um, We've got going a new cardiology arrhythmia outpatient service. We've actually um, spent quite a lot of money to create um, an appropriate facility down in the hospital. And we're also now looking at heart failure services coming out to Chepstow. So that's, again, dispersing the model of everybody having to go to Newport and, and bringing it out at local level. Um, We've improved the access to health visitor clinics. There was previously an issue with the clinics um, being in an inappropriate em environment and patients with small children having to wait with everybody else and causing a lot of disruption. So we've managed to create an area for them to go, which is greatly received by them. They're very happy with that. Um, we've done some major redesign of the accommodation because the older adult community team keeps growing as we're bringing more services on board and bringing people in from other parts of, um, of Monmouthshire and the health board. Um, and we've done some significant redesign to make their accommodation better this year, which again, I think has, has gone down very well, made a big difference. Um, we've relocated the child safeguarding team access to Caldicott because as I mentioned before we're wanting to develop Caldicott as a centre of ex expertise for children and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we've started to deliver cognitive stimulation therapy which I have to be honest and say I don't know what that is but I'm sure Claire will be able to help if people want to know about that. That's a new service that's actually happening from Howthar, which is the adult mental health service for Chepstow base. Um, and there's now a specialist behavioural support team which is a nursing team which is based locally and which goes in specifically to provide support to nursing homes to enable them to manage people better when they've got behavioural issues. Um, and we've now got in place, mentioned last time, we were looking to provide uh, additional psychology support for older adult mental health, and that is now in place as well. Um, the other things that we've got on the cards which are likely to be happening, some of them very soon, some of them over the next few months, um, the direct care team moving from Seven View is another extension to the integrated services team. That is waiting for further accommodation alterations to take place at Chepstow to enable the team to be able to access a room on a 24-hour basis because they're obviously a community-based team. Um, we're waiting for that work to be done, but that will happen very quickly now. The heart failure service, as I mentioned, is keen to come out and we're negotiating that at the moment. Um, the perinatal mental health service is due to start this month. That's a um, 
support service to people who are having mental health difficulties following delivery, uh, which is a one-to-one -one clinical service, and they're going to be coming out and providing that locally. Again, it's quite important because when mums are very very stressed, suffering from mental health problems, having a service locally is actually really important. Um, the dementia support worker, again, that was mentioned last time for the older adult um, community services, is, it, we've got somebody in there due to start in September. Um, we're also looking at some alterations to relocate the dementia assessment service to the ground floor of the hospital. At the moment, that happens on the ward upstairs, uh, on the team base, should I say, the CMHT team base. It's not an ideal environment, and we want to give people with dementia and their carers access to everything that everybody else has got around the canteen and to normalise the service. So we're moving that downstairs into what was the day hospital accommodation, which is underutilised. It won't use it full time, but that's where that'll take place. Um, and we're also negotiating other outpatient based clinics at the moment to um, further enhance what's available at local level. So there will be further outpatient clinics taking place locally. Um, the one thing that's not on that list, which um, should be because it's part of our future, is that we've negotiated for um, Caldicott Health Centre to, as I mentioned, become a sub-hub of Chepstow, which means that wherever possible, we'll provide services for local residents from Caldicott locally in their, their facility. We've recently had it wired to enable the integrated team to work from Caldicott if they're actually um, in that area rather than commuting from, from Chepstow. We've got a range of community-based clinics happening there already, which are largely but not completely for children. And we've been working with the um, Children's Social Services Head of Service and the um, Directorate within the, the Health Board to look at piloting um, an integrated children's health and social care team, which is something that isn't happening anywhere else in Gwent yet. Um, and we're looking at using Caldicott as the base for that team because there's a high younger population in Caldicott, um, a fair degree of deprivation, and we've got the building blocks already there for us to start that work. One of the things that the um, directorate of division division have offered to us from the health board is um, a consultant paediatrician from one day a week, which will be the first time we've actually had anybody out from secondary care um, on a fixed basis. The idea is that part of that consultant's time will be to help us to develop the integrative way of working for children because it will be new, we'll be cutting new ground. Um, and the other purpose of it is for education, for GPs and other health professionals and social services advice and support for the um, safeguarding and um, development of joined up care for children so that again in the same way that we're trying to pick up adults before they reach crisis we want to get to the same way of working for, for children and young people and it will also impact on our delivery of mental health and well-being services for children and young people which you'll know is one of the key priorities of the public services board so that's another way of, of working towards that goal so so just summarizing what the emerging model for south monmouthshire uh, will be um, the model of service will reflect all the guidance that's out there clinical futures care close to home the level one plans which are about um, providing services for older and vulnerable people. It will retain the inpatient beds in Chepstow. Um, in addition to the beds in Chepstow, we've also got 19 beds in Monavale. We've got six beds for rehabilitation in Mardi Park. Um, and there, are, there, are, there aren't plans to um, change the bases for, for the beds. That, that is the future. Um, the model for South Monmouthshire will be a South Monmouthshire wide model. Um, as I've said, the intention is that the Caldicott Health Centre will become a sub-hub of, of Chepstow in the same way that USC is a sub-hub of Monovale. Um, 
the neighbourhood care network <coughs> is the key vehicle for identifying and, and implementing improvements because it's the people who are part of that neighbourhood care network, the professionals that are working with people on the ground, which are health and social care professionals, they're the ones who can help us identify what the needs are. They know what people are going to surgeries with, what people are saying to them about what the gaps are in service. Um, and the Neighbourhood Care Network is working on implementing an early intervention service, help, uh, helping to keep people well at home. That's what the whole purpose of integrated working is. Um, the NCN and the, the Integrated Services Partnership Board action plans are the vehicle for the health board and the local authority to implement locally what the priorities are. So it's the way that all the PSB priorities are driven down, the local authority priorities around integrated working and care, care closer to home, and the health board's priorities about care closer to home. So the key priorities for us for this year, um, development of Chepstow and Caldicott to support the model, um, Improving integrated and community provision for people with dementia and their carers. Further development of the integrated model for older people. Development of the step up, step down model, which is the graduated care model around um, frailty assessment and the types of patients that are suitable for us to admit to the different types of beds that we have. Um, developing and starting implementation of a joint Monmouthshire estate strategy. I've mentioned that we've got the beginnings of the hubs already there. We want to work more closely between the health board and the council to look at a wider estate strategy plan. That is something that's a priority for the public services board as well and will ultimately include the other partners within the public services board, so police, fire service, Natural Resources Wales, so that we're making best use of public estate and sweating it, basically. And Chepster will be an absolutely integral part of that. We want the building to be fully utilised. Um, access and travel is something that comes up always in Monmouthshire. We're very mindful of the fact that it's difficult for people to get to, cent uh, to places when they live rurally, particularly. So the placing of the hubs and sub-hubs is a strategic placement to try to best match what we can afford to do with where the populations are. So that's why we've gone for the places that we've gone for. Um, and supporting people to actually get to those places is a key part of our strategy going forward. Um, supporting the initiation of the Crick Road Care Home Development has been another key priority for the Integrated Services Board. Um, I mentioned investigating options to develop a new integrated model for children and families. Um, ensuring that support for carers is available and enhanced is always high on our agenda. Um, and developing governance models that enable us to continue down the path that we're already on. That's something that's a, a constant headache for both organisations when you've got staff managing staff from the other organisation. And it's something that's part of my role as the integrated services manager to make sure that we are um, on the ball as far as governance around the work we're doing is concerned. Um, and then the last last slide is just what our, uh, our key milestones are. One of the things that we've been talking about extensively and which will be a key priority for us once the health board and the council are hopefully in agreement with what our plans are is to actually communicate what we're doing and to give the public a chance to actually be part of what we're doing going forward because we've we've described today the models but the detail about what's available lo locally has to be guided by, by what the public are saying we have used the needs assessments that were done for both the um, well-being of future generations and uh, social services and well-being act as part of looking at what we need but we want an ongoing conversation with people. And particularly, I think, around Chepstow, where there is a misguided perception that there isn't a place for the hospital, because that certainly has never been our intention. And we need to communicate that more clearly to people. We, we recognise we've failed as far as that's concerned. And that's something that's going to be a key thing for us going forward. Um, 
The dementia changes and evaluation of the schemes is obviously a key thing that needs to happen over the next year. Development of the clinical model, this is about um, the graduated care model for the beds and how the care of the elderly service and the child and family service models work with the consultant level intervention, how that actually fits with integrated working. Um, emotional wellbeing, I mentioned, that's a key priority for particularly for children and young people, but for everybody within wellbeing. And that's something that we are working extensively to try to find the right way forward as far as that's concerned. Um, bids to the Minor Capital Fund to make improvements to our facilities to enable them to deliver what we want is obviously a key priority for us. Uh, and governance, I've already mentioned. So those are our sort of key milestones. That, I think, is it. Thanks for that, uh, Bronwyn, Sean. Um, Sean, sorry, not Sean. <laughs> Sean and Julie. Um, I mean, obviously, this is the first time we've heard about this. It's really difficult when you first hear information. You kind of need time to absorb it. So there's a sense that in creating this picture, you've, you've provided the colour wash. Uh, so we get a, a sense and a feel of, of what's there. Uh, opening up to members, really, um, to ask questions to try and get down to some of the detail now. Who would like to go first? I, I, um, I'll say Jane. Th thanks, David. I'll just oh, make. No, you go first. You're a local well, member. <laughs> what 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 tends to happen? It tends to be. Hang on, you guys. Um, it tends to be committee members first, and then I'll I'll come to um, uh, those that say who've made the effort to get here, and obviously there are ward members as well. Brill, thanks. So Jane, over to you. Thank you very much, and. You're probably not going to like what I'm going to say, but um, I'm actually the councillor for North Monmouthshire, so a lot of this isn't relevant to me. Um, but I can say that um, I think it was Sean it, um, said that GPs paid an important part in this service delivery. I have to say, all of these um, slides and all these different diagrams, it just looks like bureaucracy gone mad to me. And, you know, what people really want is a GP and a health visitor. And what they've got is all these different teams working in different places. And I'll give you an example. I mean, I've lived where I live for five years. I've never seen a GP. And when I had a health check, I had to go to Abitillary for it. So certainly local hasn't featured at all as, as far as I can see where I am. Um, I'd like to know how many GPs we've got. I've been rang up on a, twice this year by a, a patient in Caerphilly who is absolutely desperate. I understand there's 18,000 per population to one GP in Caerphilly. So I'm concerned that GPs are an integral part of this service delivery and we just don't have them. So I'd like to know how many GPs we've got, how many, as an average, how many people per GP, because I've never seen one. And as I say, local to me, certainly, I'm not going, I'm going into Blind and Gwen, and I had to go to Abitillary. And the problem with that is, there's a lot of people who will say, well, you know, I'm not going all the way over there to a health check, so they don't get the health check. Um, at the time, I was three stone overweight. They didn't tell me that. I think with being too PC, you know, if people are overweight, we should be telling them they're overweight and we should be giving them, you know, ways of actually doing something about it. We've got a terrible problem with obesity in Wales, especially in the valleys, and with poor health, poor diet. Um, you've only got to look at, you know, the amount of carbohydrate and alcohol people are consuming and we're storing up massive problems for the future. And I don't think that preventative work is, is being done. So no wonder the National Health Service is in the crisis it is in in Wales. We've got all these vast tiers of teams. We've got all these vast tiers of different people delivering different things in different places. And as far as I can see, it's a complete mess. So I'm sorry to be so negative, but, you know, I just feel that the basics have gone. And I'd like to hear your comments. 
if I can just identify then, you, you've, you've asked about GPs, um, you've also raised the Living Well, Living Longer programme and the health check, um, um, and the bureaucracy and tiers of teams, and how we're dealing with the preventative agenda. Regarding the number of GP, GPs we've got and the number per thousand population, I can't tell you that off the top of my head today. We have got it and I can share that with you straight away as soon as I've left here. It is a variable picture across Gwent. And as you quite rightly have pointed out, Caerphilly, particularly North Caerphilly, is one of our key problem areas. And yes, as a health board, we've had to deal with considerable problems because GPs have resigned or retired handed back the contract and we've advertised and cannot recruit GPs. This is a national problem, but particularly to our valley areas, we are finding it difficult to recruit. But this new model that we've talked about today helps us in that situation. And what we are doing in Caerphilly at the moment and the feedback we are getting <coughs> from our patients and the population within those areas is very, very positive because it was a very difficult period but we are turning that around and what we are doing is acknowledging that people are coming to see the GP for lots of issues that affect them, rightly so, that are affecting their, their health and well-being. But a GP isn't necessarily the answer to that. And there's lots of evidence that shows that people go to the GPs for a myriad of, of reasons that other people could could reasonably see them for. So if we have got a difficulty in recruiting GPs and we can't magic them out of thin air, we have to find other ways of dealing with people's problems. And the first thing to do is put the appropriate conditions to the appropriate person. It makes, it's prudent, it makes sense. So we are developing physiotherapists who are very adept, probably better for dealing with many of the musculoskeletal conditions people come in with. We are looking at pharmacists who can provide and practice-based pharmacists, who can really review medication and have the time to review the medication. We've got occupational therapists working within practices because they have a brilliant way of dealing with behavioural issues. And some of our frequent attenders, the people who have very disordered lives for lots of different reasons, we can help them more by giving them that time and support and more nurturing rather than trying to get through a 10-minute appointment system. We are trying to do more with um, signposting people to that network that Julie's talked so eloquently about today for Monmouthshire, because we've got that all across Gwent, that rich resource of, of networks that a lot of people need help and support with, because people go to the GP because they're lonely and are feeling isolated. They go to the GP because debt is an issue for them or their housing issues. And we need to give them the right support at the right time rather than, you know, wasting a GP appointment and then further delay for the person in getting the help that they need. So it's that much more ease of, of, of um, access to services and support that they need. So this new model, which looks bureaucratic, and I can understand we've showered you with a lot of pictures today, but actually, I think, personally, and it'd be nice to see if the panel agrees with me, I think the plans are about removing a lot of that bureaucracy. The fact that we have got a lot of teams operating, not so much in Monmouthshire, but in Caerphilly, where you've, you've mentioned, we've got a lot of these teams working in silos. And there's lots of handoffs between teams because you have to access those teams. And what this plan does, and what we've been trying to do in Monmouthshire for some time now, is reduce those handoffs, those handing people off to these through these bureaucratic processes and making sure that people see an integrated team. And as in Monmouthshire, if somebody comes for help, we don't hand off. We take hold of that and bring in the help that they need from the integrated team that work around you in that co-located base where you have conversations and have a meaningful relationship with each other and with the person. It's about asking what matters to them. It's a different approach. And that's what we need to do. So I'm hopeful that this new model will take away some of that bureaucracy you are feeling. Yeah, if I can just come back and say that, obviously, you need a professional person. And a doctor is a professional person. He has to... He or she has to have a, you know, an in-depth training, which takes six years. And they ha you have to have somebody at the beginning of this process diagnosing that person, looking at them, and 
deciding what is the best care for them. And if people can't get to that person, can't get to their GP, who then points them in the right direction, then we've got a serious issue. I think if we had loads and loads of GPs, it would be brilliant if GPs were the only one who could signpost people to other services. So you can go and see your GP because you've got a debt problem and the GP says, hang on a minute, I will sort out where you need to go. We haven't got that luxury and I don't think it's a good use of their time. Those other people I've mentioned are also professionals. They have also trained and know what they are doing in their particular fields. But in all of this, we never say you don't see a GP. If somebody really needs to see a GP, we ensure that happens. And what we're finding by implementing this new model, by putting support around very frazzled, stressed GPs, because there's not enough of them to deal with the demands of this older population, we're actually finding we are starting to recruit GPs and we are starting to be able to attract them so they are still a key part of that team, very much so. But having that team helps them in their job and helps us to recruit and helps to have a rich resource that's available for, for the patient. So uh, I feel our strategy that has come from national direction, but which we were building on locally anyway, is the, is the right one. Um, just wanted to quickly, so that, that I hope answers in some mean, meagre way the GP issue and the tiers of teams. The health check... I'll have a look at the locations for that. The Health Check, the Living Well, Living Longer programme, is about prevention. It is about identifying those people. It started off with identifying people at risk of a, a cardiac incident. So they, you, we offer it to, to people over a certain age. It started off, we, we were piloting it in, in um, Blaine Gwent to start off with. It's rolled out to Caerphilly. It's gradually rolling out elsewhere. It might be that on the cusp of Monmouthshire and Blaine Gwent there in the, in the Gilwyn area, it might have felt as if a location in Blaine Gwent was, um, was um, an, a, a plausible place for you to go. But certainly I will, I will double check where exactly we're offering the health checks to make sure they're as local as possible. Regarding how useful it was, I'm very happy to take your own particular experience away. We do have quite good positive feedback from a, a, a lot of people, but I take what your experience was and I take what you said. Um, do understand the problems of obesity, which affects people in so many ways. And you're right, we need different ways of helping people to deal with those issues. And I think it's through our resilient community networks we do that rather than patronising professionals, telling people what to do, because we don't seem to be working very well with that, and that's how people see us, unfortunately. So we have to think differently as those, those, those people who work within, within the statutory sectors about how best we get these messages to people. But certainly there would have been no intention to try and hide any issue with you, and happy to, to take that forward, and it's a good feedback for us to take back regarding that. Thanks, Sean. Um, uh, I say thank you because I think that was very comprehensive and, may I say, passionate um, answer there to the question. And I think it, it, it gets us sort of thinking about things. Ultimately, we feel there is not enough GPs. And I guess your answer is people are going to GPs who they shouldn't be going to GPs. So if you've got a, a tickly cough, they're going to GPs when actually probably the pharmacist, that's probably one of the 17 yes. common um, Ill illnesses. Um, so I guess it's, it's that sort of element. Um, I've got um, Councillor Brown, then Councillor Harris. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I mean, there's a, an awful lot of questions um, that I would uh, like to ask. I mean, um, I'm, I, I am in favour of an integrated approach because I think that's the sensible way to go in terms of resources and so forth. But my concern um, relates to um, generic health care in um, Chapstow Hospital. And this model has, co has come up, and obviously uh, I understand that the um, dementia ward is now officers, and I don't know exactly how um, uh, this uh, care is going to be provided. I mean, one of the, in terms of generic care, I would certainly like um, you to come back to explain in terms of the services that we had um, 
previously in Chepstow Hospital and the services that we've got now because obviously um, I'm not against this model but what I uh, I would like to see is um, you know um, uh, perhaps a building elsewhere being used for it because I would like to see the or not necessarily um, it completely taking over the hospital because the, there is an importance of all age health care for people that hospitals normally provide. The minor injuries unit disappeared. Lydney Hospital um, is in the process of closing and so Chepstow residents won't have the option of going to Lydney rather than the Gwent if they're, you know, if they're suffering from, uh, you, you know, literally if they're bleeding. And, um, you know, the, there's other services, hospital services, that aren't being provided at Chepstow. I know, for example, uh, last year, in terms of, uh, my, in my own experience, in terms of outpatient and inpatient care, I had to go to, um, on outpatient to uh, Ebervale, Abergavenny, Newport, and um, also, uh, I couldn't have the operation in Newport because they said it wasn't de definite that it would happen. So I ended up in Eustred. Now, fortunately, I've got a car and I can travel all over. But those uh, health services, both um, inpatient and outpatient, were not available locally. There'll also be more pressure on the Chepstow Hospital due to the fact that this Lydney Hospital is closing. So we're likely to get more Gloucestershire people coming over for uh, care into Chepstow. So the question is, is I would like you to come back to explain about the um, you know, ge generic side of health care for people in, in Chepstow who, and in South Monmouthshire who actually need it. Um, I'll come back later on to the various other questions um, that I've got. But I'm not against this model, and I think it's a sensible way to go. But what I'm concerned about is the need locally for general hospital services being available and it's a postcode lottery because I can remember sitting in Newport and somebody said uh, there oh you know they could get all of their services very locally didn't have to travel here there and everywhere for outpatient and inpatient care and I think access and travel is very important for us and care closer to the uh, community means both um, outpatient and inpatient care available locally and I think you know you've got to think about that as well I'm not against the model I think it's a good model but I think we've got to think about the services the general hospital services that are available for local residents and this particular issue hasn't been consulted upon uh, locally and uh, as I say I think it's a good issue uh, a good way to go but I'm just concerned about the buildings that you're using and um, in terms of making sure that you've got um, uh, generic services available for uh, the local population thank you Over to you there. I'll start off and I'm sure Braun will be able to enhance what, what, what I might say thank you for, for the question Councillor Brown and I think we are I'm hopefully that we are trying to build up those generic services. Um, we are trying to improve the amount of outpatients being seen at Chepstow, which I was hoping the slides might have demonstrated, and the fact that we want to do more of that. Your own particular situation um, is difficult to answer, but I'm happy to have the details of that and look at what happened with you in terms of having to go to Ebervale, Abergavenny, Newport, and Astrid, Aspetti Astrid Vowell. So it's, it's difficult to answer that without knowing the specifics, but happy to take that up with you outside of the meeting to analyse what happened there. But certainly our intention is to get as much locally as we possibly can that is safe to do so, that is appropriate to do so within the environments that we've got. And that's, that is our intention and, and to prevent the travelling. Um, I don't know if there's anything more you can add to that, Bron, in terms of what we're doing at Chepstow. Yeah, I think, um, <laughs> um, I think one important point to mention is that if you look back to when Chepstow opened, it provided community beds and a very limited range of outpatient mm -hmm. clinics, very limited, and a minor injuries unit. Since then, the reason that the beds have closed, the community beds I'm talking about, is 
due to the success of the integrated team. It isn't a failure. It isn't because local people who need community beds are having to go elsewhere. It's because more people are able to stay at home because the integrated team has successfully managed getting people out of hospital sooner, which is where most people want to be. So the closure of the, of the beds on the community side to this point has been a positive, not a negative. So just to sort of put it in that context, we have, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, done a lot of work around increasing outpatients. We're, I'll be honest, we're never going to get to the point where every outpatient appointment for people who live in Chepstow will be happening in Chepstow because it's all about the volume of patients for particular clinics. It's about the way that the consultant medical teams need to work to be their most effective. So the targets that we've set ourselves are around high volume services for people who find it very difficult to get to other centres. That's our initial target. And that's been led by the clinicians actually working with patients, seeing them in their GP practices, etc., and identifying what those services are that need to come locally. So that's why we've got more care of the elderly services locally. That's why we've got more children's services locally. And that's our target. We are not going to get to the point where we're providing plastic surgery outpatients in Chepstow Hospital. That, that isn't part of the model for the future. So just to sort of clarify that. Um, in terms of the all-age healthcare point that Councillor Davis made, we totally agree with that. That's what we're trying to do, is to get all services provided locally where that's feasible. And it shouldn't be for older people only. It should be for all ages. Children and families are a key target for us, and we want to make sure that they can also access as much as possible at local level. And just one other sort of point of clarity. I think we mentioned this last time, actually. We haven't taken over the older adult mental health ward that's closed with officers. It's actually been mothballed at the moment until we decide what the most appropriate use for it is. So it isn't that we've put loads of things in there and not told people about it. It, it is vacant. So just so, so you're aware of that. Uh, thanks, Bronwyn. Um, do you want to come briefly on one of those points? But yeah, yeah just, just I think... I think it would be very useful if, if um, um, the health board could, could come back, um, basically, to go through the um, sort of list of what services were, hospital services were available um, generally in Chepstow and what's available now and, you know, how this can develop in the future. I think, uh, you know, I didn't like the plastic surgery uh, thing because I thought that was a little bit flippant because, you know, these are important issues, particularly like on my minor injuries if you're you know if you can't make it to Newport and uh, you know you're in a in a bad way I think I think these issues uh, I don't think you, we, we should be flippant with people's uh, generic care and um, you know I, I just didn't didn't like that uh, example thank you um, thanks oh. yeah um, um, thanks uh, Councillor Brown I know you've got some more questions and I've got you back in the list for later on. So we've got Councillor Harris and then Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. You did mention at the pre-meeting that uh, maybe we shouldn't get uh, uh, political. Oh, so uh, um, uh, it's happened. It's happened. So uh, that's not surprising. Uh, what I would say is that uh, I'm sure you good people out there, if you had all the money in the world, would give us everything absolutely we wanted. And we're sitting here in cloud cuckoo land if we think that is the, uh, uh, the situation. It's not. It's unlikely uh, uh, to be in the, uh, the near future. And what I've heard encourages me. Rather than gloom and uh, doom, it looks like you've thought about a massive integration um, so that anybody uh, that comes along with a particular problem with a bit of luck can get diagnosed and put down the, um, the right path. And the, if the right path happens to be, if you're living in Chepstow, that you have to go to Abergavenny for the best possible uh, uh, way of curing whatever your problem is, 
then as a patient, I think I'd be very pleased with that. It might be damn inconvenient getting there, but I know that I'm going to get the best possible uh, treatment rather than go down the road and get inferior treatment. That means sooner or later maybe I'll be in hospital. So we should never forget that. We have to travel. It's the way uh, life is uh, these days. So I'm delighted to hear what you've uh, been saying this morning. I think you put an awful lot of uh, uh, work in. And uh, I'd like to uh, make sure that you let us have the um, slides so we can look in, in, in greater detail. And maybe um, you should come back and, and, and talk to all of us rather than just uh, uh, this committee in, in, in full council to let us know what you're uh, attempting to, uh, uh, to do. One other thing while, I, while I'm at it, you, you were talking about the pharmacies and the 17 common ailments. A lot of us here um, produce newsletters. Um, please will you let us have, uh, please do uh, just send an email to all of us. If we can use it, we will um, use it. And I think it's important to take the load off GP surgeries um, if we can go to, uh, uh, to pharmacies to get information that doesn't really require a, a, a GP or A&E. And that's the trouble with lots of, uh, lots of people just go straight to uh, A&E and, and, and block that. So I'm pleased with what I've heard so far and uh, keep up the good work. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Harris. Um, I'm jotting down and I've put down there as a possible recommendation because I think that's a brilliant idea how we can um, help in that campaign. Uh, and I, I thank you for not mentioning the C word or the L word. <laughs> uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. I don't want to rain on anybody's parade, but not in this term of the council, but a previous one. I had mentioned and everybody said, what a good idea. We've got a new livestock market, and I'd suggested having a clinic there. Maybe it's open on a Monday and a Wednesday. Because in my ward, which is 12 and a half miles across, there's not one shop. I've got eight churches, so you show what the scattered uh, number of residents are, and I've got two schools. But it's very rural. The majority is agriculture, obviously, and I've got a lot of farmers, and the average age is like late 50s to 60. A lot of them are getting elderly, living on their own, a lot of bachelors. And perhaps the only day they go from there, mightn't be every week, but most weeks they'd be taking stock to market. They have ailments such as prostate cancer that they don't talk about, bowel cancer, diabetes, arthritis, and overweight and they're never told to lose any weight my husband being one of them who has to request the doctor to okay him to go to a gym which seems a bit strange he had two new knees but nobody followed that up with any reasoning to lose weight or anything apart from me nagging so my suggestion was that they should have a clinic at the market it belongs to the authority so that it could be like a drop-in session whether it's a doctor or as you suggest, a pharmacist or something that they could go in because farmers are notorious for keeping things close to their chest. They don't talk to one another and a lot of them haven't got a wife or anybody to sort of bounce it off to say, do you think I'm diabetic or I've got an awful bad shoulder? And they put up with it. And then it's, you've lost the point of early diagnosis of these things especially if it's a cancer or something like that. And I'm just wondering, could we not even pilot it there um, so that it would help keep them perhaps into um, being, um, I wouldn't say cured, but treated without having to end up in the hospital, whereas I know one ended up with sepsis or you can have amputations and all that sort of thing simply because they haven't got anybody to suggest it or they don't want to, they don't like to bother people is a, a term they generally use. And, and of course, they're the ones that lose out. And in rural North Monmouthshire, this is becoming quite a problem where I always thought prevention was better than the cure. So I'm hoping that perhaps something could come of this 
rather than it just put into the long grass, as they say in farming terms. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Ruth. Um, I hope you're forgiven by your husband for name and shaming him. <laughs> um, um, oh, and that the nation knows now. <laughs> um, Eve, over to you. I'm not sure. If, oh, it is working. I've got no light, but I'm on. Um, I think, Councillor Edwards, that's a, a marvellous idea. And I think that um, I, my, I'm north, which is probably why I've been fairly quiet um, so far. So uh, I'm involved with uh, the north of Monmouthshire. Um, and we have um, teams of specialist nurses who manage chronic conditions particularly. So a lot of what you're talking about around things like, you know, blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, exercise, etc. Uh, and I'm sure that team would love an in where they would be able to support um, that sort of initiative, whether that be at the livestock market we would be more than happy for you to lead us on. We can do our business wherever it suits. You know, we are the community. We have the hubs, which is obviously our homes and our go-to places, but our, um, our nurses are there for the community. You know, they're out there in the community. They want to be part of the community. Um, so if we can have a conversation at some point afterwards, then I'm sure if you can give us the in as to where we could do that at places like the livestock market, you can have our staff yeah. without a shadow of a doubt. Thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. That, that's excellent, excellent. I've got that down as a recommendation. That's brilliant. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Grocut, um, and then Councillor Brown, and then Councillor Woodhouse. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, we're told often uh, that in Wales, the one, one of the problems and dilemmas of providing healthcare is that we are... Uh, an increasingly elderly population, and that that's a Welsh dimension to health need. Um, I, I frequently deny it, but my wife does tell me that actually I'm part of that uh, <laughs> age group myself. Um, what I've heard this morning, uh, I've still got some concerns about, if, if you like, the balance between some of the key things you've been talking about, local services, uh, integrated services uh, and effective services and and I'm not sure that we've actually got that balance right um, for example um, in the presentation we heard about three different boards that all are looking to integrate services so we heard about the public service board we heard about the integrated partnership board we heard about the Regional Partnership Board. Now, it seems to me that all of these boards must be serviced by professional people skilled in their jobs. Um, but they ain't helping people get better in the community. Um, now, um, I hate it when, when councillors start talking about their personal things, but it's not going to stop me. Uh, I... I uh, I actually uh, made an appointment to see my GP, not, not because uh, I'm lonely or because I've got uh, financial problems, but because I was in considerable pain. Um, and I was uh, referred on for ultrasound, which I had in Newport by my GP in Abergavenny. Uh, and that was in early February. Uh, and then... At the start of August, I went to see a consultant in Torvine. Uh, within 10 minutes, he told me that the preliminary diagnosis that had led to the referral wasn't right uh, and that he could do no more until I'd had x-rays. He marked the form urgent. Uh, that was on the 3rd of August. I, I still haven't heard anything further about that. Uh, and, and I just wonder that... In, 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 in this drive to integrate, we get in the balance wrong between bureaucracy and treatment, uh, and, and, and treatment in the locality. Now, my, my GP surgery in Abergavenny uh, is fantastic, and last year uh, abolished uh, the ability of people to ring in advance uh, and book appointments. You literally do it on the day, and you're seen that day. So I have absolutely no objection to that. It's where it gets down to integrated services. So I've now been seen in three different local authority areas. I appreciate it's one area as far as you're concerned. But at the end of the day, um, 
after a referral in February, I still have no idea what sort of treatment I've got or even what my difficulty is. Um, if I, I, I think other people might want to come in on this because that, that you, you raised some really interesting points there. And I look to Julie to help me through the bureaucracy of the boards because mm. we agree. <laughs> and there's not much we can we can do about it. The regional partnership board is prescribed through statute, through the, the social services and wellbeing act. Public service boards are still there, although I know people are reviewing and wondering what what happens to them. Personally, this is just my personal view. The integrated partnership board mm -hmm. is the board that we get our business done. To be honest, we cut through the bureaucracy, and that's where we work together with our GP colleagues, with our social services colleagues, third sector, housing. That's where we try and make sense of it all and look at the services we provide. And for me, the integrated part of our message is very much about our community services integrating, and maybe we've misinformed there because the... The links then and the pathways into our acute services are not strictly part of that. And I take your comments say you've gone from pillar to post with some of that. Again, without knowing the specifics, um, and I know that we, we have huge problems with recruiting radiologists, and I know that, that diagnostics, we try to make sure that people get to the place where they can be seen more quickly, and that might mean um, different different locations. But I'm, again, more than happy to take up the details of your case and find out and learn from it, really, what happened there, why it happened like that, and see if we can, we can make it better. But the integrated nature is much more about our community teams. I, I, I just wanted to reiterate that, and I, I under, you know, it's really tricky, isn't it, when we're having a conversation about health and social care, because it's vast, absolutely vast. And I think one of the things that I've learned today, which I always, you always learn, don't you, is how do you, how do we distill the message to be clear about what it is that we're talking about? So we've got colleagues from health, very senior colleagues from health, who are involved in all that Gwent wide work, but obviously are very present in our Monmouthshire world. This is about the community. It's about community provision. So GPs are part of that, district nurses are part of that. And actually those... Um, disciplines, if you like, that we are in charge of and that we can um, integrate and cooperate and deliver, I, I'd like to say that we're all over that and have been for some time. When it becomes the sort of hierarchy in medicine, uh -uh, no, not there. That's not really part of what we're discussing today. So I appreciate, Councillor Grocott, your bat and balling and, and similarly with um, Councillor Pratt, the idea that but that's on a slightly different level to, to what we're responsible for. So I think we've got to try and just understand that there's this community integrated provision, both from a preventative angle and a delivery angle, where, where, where we can hands-on deliver. And within that, we have an awful lot of autonomy and flexibility. So, you know, Eve's comment, well, we can go and do that. That's great, because actually we can flex those, those professionals in the direction that we want to but at a community level, not the inter... We do have an influence between the interface with acute, definitely, but not when it comes to that medical modelling. Oh, certainly that's outside of my remit. It, it's sort of in yours, but yeah. equally it's, it's not what we're here to discuss today. But I appreciate that it ends up, you know, falling into that territory. Thanks for that. Um, thanks, Martin. And, you know, in, although you might be in the elderly age group in terms of numbers, you've still got the spirit of a young man. <laughs> um, I've got uh, Councillor Woodhouse and then Councillor Dimmick. Thank you, Chair. A couple of questions and, and an observation. Um, it's about the model working elsewhere and what sort of um, you know success it, it has in other places. You mentioned Swansea University. I, I just wonder, in a partnership, could you expand a little bit on that for us, please? Um, and how are you actually measuring the effectiveness of the model here that, 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 um, as it's you know, progressing? Um, with regard, to, uh, an observation really, with regard to public engagement, yes, it's, it's, it's very difficult to sort of communicate with lots of people. And, and uh, as Councillor Harris has pointed out, the more people that know about this, uh, certain items, the better. Do not miss out voluntary groups. I mean, especially the ones connected with the hospitals, 
you know, I'm just thinking of Neville Hall in, in, in because that's what I went from the note from Abergavenny, and there are three voluntary groups there you can connect with. There are more, a lot more, but there's three I could just think of off the top of my head. And um, this is a question for the chair, perhaps with, with the North Monmouthshire hat on, without thinking about Lenfrec for Grange, um, the, the new hospital is going to be Lenfrec for. Could we have a similar presentation, perhaps, about the, the progress and, um, uh, you know, at the appropriate time? I think that would be very interesting. I note there was a present, there was an information stand at Monmouthshire show, at a show in the Monmouthshire um, tent, which was, was very good to see. So if I could just ask that question as well at this moment. Thank you. Just in terms of the last one, I'm, I'm writing a sort of suggestions that people are coming up with and we'll come back at the end and we'll vote on what we want to have added that on there. And you'll have to say it and pronounce it. I'm not very good at pronouncing it. So, um, um, so uh, answering the questions yeah, around the, the models elsewhere and how to measure success. Um, thank you for those questions, Councillor Woodhouse. Particularly, um, if I pick up the Swansea University question and the play. So obviously, I was talking about that frog's bone, the image of, you know, um, interestingly, lots of voluntary groups and lots of third sector within that network. Um, the partnership with Swansea University is very much a research partnership. So it's looking at that early intervention place-based model that we've got that, that's really trying to, at a community level, connect with people and make a difference through the agents of those organisations. So there are support workers, there are all sorts of different workers who are working to support people's well-being all over Monmouthshire. So, for example, we have the, um, um, the, the, the well-being volunteering um, approach that is, is proving to be very... Um, popular and very much a strengths based you know a lot today we've talked about people wanting and needing support often what we found is people want to contribute actually to the support to others and that's been a, a very key learning so the partnership with Swansea University is them partnering the work that we're doing in order to evidence the impact so that's part of the measurement question and obviously we'll be bringing that back here um, at some point um, the uh, program is, is is due to run until the end of the year, so it'll be it'll be into into the beginning of next year. In terms of modelling and measuring all of the work that we have around our integrated uh, work, it's a key topic of conversation at our integrated service partnership board. Uh, we have lots of data, we have lots of numbers, we have lots of things about activity. What we want to get to is a better place where we can actually measure the outcomes. What are the outcomes for individuals? I think it's fair to say we're doing some of that not bad we got a bit to travel on that and i think it's it's something that we we want to really try and get to a position where we would be able to alongside potentially the information from swansea university be able to bring a suite of information and whether that both quantitative and qualitative that says this is how the integrated modeling is working in monmouthshire like i say not quite there but definitely way up high on the agenda for us to because it's quite hard to do it's very personal it's very individual you can do it at numbers levels but actually we want to know what's the impact for people we have lots of that information we have lots of stories we have lots of thank you cut you know we have lots and lots of data and information that we need to collate together to to bring a coherent picture but definitely um something we want to do yeah i would endorse um Judy's um, comments there around the actual outcomes for people and what matters to people. But to give you some reassurance about evaluation on the broader level, the Healthier Wales document came out with what it calls its transformational model for primary community care. And it was developed because um, a couple of years ago, Welsh Government had issued a primary care plan for Wales, um, noting the sustainability problems and the fact that there needed to be a different approach given um, the demands likely to be placed on services and what we needed to plan for for the future. And there was primary care monies available for that. And what they did on an all Wales basis through, through Public Health Wales was evaluated those, and it was kind of aspects of the, of the model were being done in different places. So we've been very fragmented and we've tried bits and pieces here and there. And they were evaluated, and from that was, was developed this, this is what is working on the evaluations we've got. This is what looks like um, achieving good outcomes. That's what um, 
predicated the plan that we've got. So there has been some evaluation around that. And indeed, we've done it in pockets locally. But you're quite right. What we haven't done is looked at if the whole of that model. So if you've got primary care and GP surgeries working as best that they can in the current pressures with the demands being placed on it, if you've got integrated community teams around them, um, supporting and developing the response to people at that lower level um, and making sure that we are identifying those people who need the more specialist needs and getting better pathways for, for, for linking into that. If we um, are involved in our communities um, in terms of engaging both ways, knowing what communities want, but helping us to get messages out, as we've talked about this morning, to the communities, what impact is that going to have for people? <coughs> Are we able to offer people what they require for keeping them safe and well at home? And what the plan says is, please come back to us with your proposals for, for piloting the whole model somewhere and let's evaluate it and lo let's look at the impact. So that's very much part of ongoing discussions about how we do that evaluation in a more robust way than we've currently been able to do it. And even having said all of that, I think the patient-related outcomes is still something we need to do lots and lots of work on about how we really are able to measure what really mattered to that person in, in terms of all that we've done. So I think it's a very valid point and I hope there's been some hope that there is some evaluation going on, but I think it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more work needs to be done around that. And the voluntary group thing, absolutely agree. And we are certainly looking, and they, you know, the voluntary groups, they should be part of our integrated teams. And they are part of the, of the answer to, 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 to lots of problems. And, and I think we need to build that up and certainly looking to do that. Yes, especially with the voluntary groups, because they, they, they are there. You've just got to tap into them. And um, very often they're just so busy getting on with what they're doing, whether it's a coffee shop or, or, or any other sort of service. But they do want to know what's happening in their own hospital, in, in, in you know, the health authority in, in, in general. Thank you. Yeah, um, sorry, just one. I'd forgotten it. Um, we've been looking at some work they've done in Froome in Somerset lately. Um, um, and a lot of work that they have done over the last three years in terms of liaising with, with such groups in actually having much more of a structured way of, of utilising those services has had lots of good outcomes for people. So we are looking at where there appears to be places that have got this right and got the balance right. So we are endeavouring to learn as best we can. But yeah. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm, I'm just aware, um, Sean and Bronwyn, are you all right for water there? You're okay. Yes. Yeah. It's fine. Okay. Um, I've got uh, Councillor Dimmick. Thank you. I desperately need a toilet break as well. <laughs> so I will dash as soon as I've asked my question. I just want to make a few comments and ask a couple of questions. Um, it was what Bromrin said with regards to who the services at Chepstow Hospital are available to. Um, you said about older people. There are young people in our county living with chronic illness and Obviously, people are trying to work alongside that, and I think it needs to be available to them at the same time. Um, I don't really agree with Councillor Harris for saying people should be able to travel out of the county. Anyone that's had, and I'm sure everyone in these chambers today has had someone with um, diagnosis, illnesses, travelling back and forth hospitals week in, week out is so stressful. It's incredibly stressful and it takes a massive toll, not just on the patient, but for their family members as well. So we do need to keep things on our doorstep or as close as possible. Um, I do agree with Councillor Harris on us sharing uh, support and your services that you offer. I think communication. I didn't know that these services were available at Chapstow Hostel. I actually live in Chapstow and I actually and one of the patients to one of these, and I didn't know those services were available. So that's great, but we need to communicate that message to everyone. So I would more than happily share that. I agree with him on that one. Um, and just on the additional services you are offering, the six there, how many of those have been implemented and are all of them going to be available by the end of this year? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, in terms of access for younger people with chronic illnesses, we totally agree with you on that. 
one of the key things we've been doing in trying to localise services is to make sure that people with chronic illnesses who need regular visits are actually able to access those locally. So things like diabetes, chronic pulmonary disease, those sorts of things are key to us actually being able to provide a local service. Um, I'm sure there's probably more that could, we could be doing, and I will take that point back to um, our NCN leads to see if there is anything else that we could offer along those lines. But it is very much on our agenda. Um, in terms of the six services, I'm, within the presentation, was it the ones that are currently there that you're talking about, or the ones for 2018? The ones for 2018. Okay. Um, I just need to refresh my memory onto um, what we have there. Yep, yeah, got it. Right. Um, Okay, so the ones that are already there are in place. The ones that are planned to be provided, is that the ones you mean, the direct care service, that, that list there? Um, the direct care team, we are waiting for um, the key lock system on the door to be done and a minor alteration within the room. That should be within the next, I would say, two months. Um, the heart failure service, we're negotiating with the division of cardiology at the moment for that service that's a nurse-led service the nurse who's providing it has um, got a tail of patients on another site that she needs to um, move to other clinics first so they book so many weeks in advance so the hope is but we are reliant on that division actually delivering on this the hope is that that will be in around november time but we haven't had a final confirmation of date from the cardiology directorate to confirm that yet um the perinatal mental health service is imminent that i the first clinic is in september but i can't give you the exact date i think it's something around the 18th but i'm i know it's booked in i i I can come back and confirm the actual date. Um, the dementia support worker is in post, I think it's the 23rd of September, so that one is imminent. Um, that's this month. Um, the relocation of the dementia assessment service to the ground floor, we need to do some alterations to the day hospital to make it more dementia friendly because there are issues around changes in floor types and various other <coughs> Um, requirements that we have to comply with to make the, the space suitable that we hope will be done by the end of the year I don't think it's going to be any sooner than that we're in the process of moving those clinics we can from older adult mental health down but the whole service it's not likely to be until the end of the year um, and the other outpatient clinics which we are negotiating the consultant paediatrician that I mentioned to go to Caldicott um, he is ready to come out we have to do a couple of things before he is able to come out. The primary one is that we need to be able to provide some level of reception and admin support for that clinic, which is awaiting funding at the moment, isn't it, Sean? That's, that's the key, key one. Um, again, I hope we'll be able to do that by the end of this year. That's the intention. Um, but we are, in the meantime, we're actually starting to provide some of the non-patient facing services for children's services from Caldicott. So we're moving ahead with the development, although the clinic itself is, is proving to be, because it costs money, that's basically why. So that, that's the sort of update on. Are you happy with that, Councillor? Yeah, thank you ever so much. Um, and I hope you come back and share your progress and your achievements with us, I really do. That, okay, okay. Um, Roger, do you want to quickly come back on that bit before she goes through the door? I think she, <laughs> Roger just wants to. Um... Don't worry. I'm going to... Yeah, yeah. It's 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 just to say that uh, I said um, every patient should really want to go to a centre of excellence that uh, provided the best possible uh, uh, result for them. And everyone's been given examples. I'm going to give an example. Uh, I had major heart surgery, but I had to have it in the, uh, the Heath. Maybe it might have been available in Abergavenny, but I wouldn't have had that top-notch surgeon there. 
My wife recently had serious back operation and she initially had to, uh, to travel to a strip mullock and she had the operation in, uh, in the uh, Royal Gwent. It's ov obviously stressful for the patient um, and you know, we, we, had to, we had to travel or we had the opportunity of, uh, we, we could actually uh, do it. Um, but that's, that's just it, you know, she had the best possible care and a, a, a perfectly good outcome. And uh, we just got to keep that in mind. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Um, I'm going now to Councillor Pavier, then uh, Councillor Brown, and then we'll go on to those who aren't members of the committee, if everybody's happy with that, is that okay? Thank you, Chair. Um, I think from the discussion this morning, I think it's, it's obvious that we need to develop more capacity in primary care, not just to um, ensure that you know, we take the pressure off our acute services, but to ensure we're, we're living better, more healthier lives in our community, in our homes where we want to be. Um, and it's absolutely right, you know, the GP may not be the first point of call for some. Um, I personally, I, I always use the pharmacist first. and I've always found that to be a, a very good service for those, those, for those minor ailments. Um, but again, we need those uh, initial points of contact that will sift and signpost people um, initially away from GPs because we need to take the pressure off GPs. Um, but then, you know, there needs to be a, a direct route then um, f to, to, to the most uh, appropriate professional. Um, so I'm certainly pleased with the, the advanced nature of, of, of the integrated services that we've, we've seen this morning. Uh, I have to say there's some, probably some H LHBs in Wales who, s who struggle to s uh, envisage the regional eco uh, health economy outside of their hospital walls. So it, it is it's good to see that we are uh, advancing here in Monmouthshire. Um, but in terms of going back to some of the um, the, the, the practical general health services and I, you know, I appreciate what um, Julie has said but it is a concern of local people that um, you know, we have seen services, uh, some services disappear and that, that's, that's something you obviously didn't put on your, um, on your uh, presentation. You know, we've seen the loss of um, over the last five or six years, we've seen continence outpatients go, podiatry outpatients go gynaecology outpatients go, ear, nose and throat outpatients go, and of course minor uh, injuries as well, which is the most important, uh, I think, for local people. You know, you, you say about high volume practices, you know, there's no more high volume practices than, than, than minor injuries. And, you know, I, I understand what Councillor Harris says, absolutely right. You know, I, I wouldn't want to see either emergency or elective surgery of, you know, on serious issues like, you know, heart or is it cancer treatment, um, you know, um, cancer removal um, being done in, in, in local centres, that, that wouldn't be appropriate. But it doesn't, um, it wouldn't negate some minor surgery being done locally, you know, keyhole surgery. You know, there's, there's no reason why that couldn't, couldn't happen. Um, you know, Judith Paget uh, sent a letter to me last year saying, you know, promising that, um, in negotiations with Valinda, Valinda Cancer Trust, we're going to see community chemotherapy um, services being brought to Chepstow Hospital. I mean, where's that? that that's, that's gone silent. Um, you know, there's no reason why there couldn't be um, community, um, uh, other community services like uh, uh, renal analysis, uh, dialysis, etc., could be brought to to the um, to the hospital there. Uh, and the other issue as well, you know, even when you've got radiology services, you know, when someone has to wait four weeks from the diagnostic point of diagnostic engagement and to have that um, particular x-ray uh, analysed and interpreted and then, you know, got back to in four weeks, I mean, that's unacceptable. That is unacceptable. I mean, that's happening in Chester. I mean, I understand it's happening somewhere uh, up in Abergavenny as well. I mean, that's just, that's not, that's just not acceptable. So... Going back to um, integrated services, um, obviously I, I'm interested in the funding side behind that. Um, you know, you said about ICF funding, you know, and the transformation funding that's, that's come from Healthier Wales. You know, they're not going to last forever. Uh, the important thing for me, um, and you know, there's obviously Welsh government consultation out now on strengthening partnership, the partnership regulations and statutory guidance in, in, under Part Nine, particularly around pool budgets. 
is around, I suppose, effective um, a parity of steam, a parity of esteem of allocation and funds and uh, and uh, and decision making around funds as well. I mean, we're always going to be the as in local authorities. We're always going to be the junior partners to you guys in health, um, and you know from past experience. That what the health board wants, the health board gets, uh, and they 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 tend to be um, use their weight in that in that way. I'd be interested to to understand some of the 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 mechanisms around funding and financing, and and how you envisage that. Um, um, I suppose that you know the, the continuity of funding to 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 continue after the well those big pots of Boscombe government funding probably will be removed with, with you know within the next three to five years. So that's that's my that's my uh, input. Thank you. I'll have a go at that. Um, regarding um, there is consultation out and work ongoing on pool budgets at the moment, but just to make sure that um, people are aware here that we actually do operate a section thirty through three pool budget arrangement in terms of our integrated teams already within Monmouthshire. So we have already um, pooled our budgets here. Um, I no, think so in terms can, of... Sorry, can I just... Inter is, is, that, is that a true pool budget or is that, is that a non-risk transactional pool budget? Pass. It's a Section 33. You're an expert on the Section 33, Pron. <laughs> organizations we're engaged in those um, all the time really aren't we and Eve is the living embodiment of the section 33 in Mona Vale she probably talk more eloquently than than we can well I, I suppose is that working I can't tell myself it. Um, you know I mean I'm employed by the health board but I I manage as many staff from the health board as I do from the local authority in, in fact probably more from the local authority um, so I'm, I've got responsibility for a variety of budgets that have all been delegated to me from both organisations. Um, and I do therefore have a level of autonomy and flexibility on spending that money in a way that is um, prudent from the public purse perspective, but also in what's right for the patient or person that we're serving. Some of that is in a pooled um, budget which is a legal arrangement whether that's section 33 money from frailty or from monovale but that's also from you know the local authority those budgets sit under me and from the health board those budgets sit under me and that goes um, for all of the hubs so i have responsibility for monovale and usk and that the same applies in chepstow and in abergavenny Are you happy with that, Councillor Paviers? Do you want to come back? Or? Well, you know, in terms of the general, uh, uh, you know, general healthcare points. I mean, if you could take them back, I mean, I think there was that there's sort of an expectation of uh, amongst councillors that you will come back and, and and focus a little bit more on those those other health services beyond the integration work that's, that, that's done here. So, you know, that I'd certainly welcome that. Yeah, I can th I can give you some immediate feedback on a couple of them. Um, the chemotherapy service. It was something that we initiated, Andy Gray, who's the NCN lead in the South, um, and myself, looked at what would benefit patients locally, and we approached Valindra Hospital to see whether they would be willing to outreach a chemotherapy service to Chepstow. I think it would be fair to say that the response was one of amazement that no local community team had ever gone to them before and asked whether that could happen. Um, and they have, to date, been unable to actually meet our request. It's something we still want to do. We're really keen to get those services, as we mentioned earlier, for people who've got chronic illnesses, people with cancer, they're the people who really do need to have that service provided locally if at all possible but we can't actually make decisions about things like that we are dependent on other services changing their model of service to make it happen um, on the other outpatient services which you, you mentioned had been reduced from Chepstow I didn't pick that up when I actually looked at the outpatient clinic list so I'll have to go back and find out whether that is the case but what we have been doing is actively approaching um, the consultant-led services from 
the Royal Gwent and Neville Hall to ask them whether they're willing to come out. And that's, that's the process that we've been following. I think when the clinical pathways are more clearly developed under the clinical futures model forwards, then it'll be clearer to them which services need to come out. So where, where we are at the moment is that some services have been very proactive and have said, yeah, we want to come out and we've negotiated with them to set a clinic up. Others have not fully thought through yet how their models will work. I think that would be fair to say, wouldn't yes. it, Sean? Yeah. Um, and we are involved in those new pathways for clinical futures. So we are putting in the um, ask for local services as much as we possibly can. And we know that not everything can come out. And we know that some some places need to be centralised and they need the support of, of services we can't provide locally, certainly some of the diagnostics and, and so forth. But wherever we can... Um, we are pushing, and we have got a place around the table to discuss that, um, and 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 as as, w as well as our GPs. So we are we are part of those discussions. Thanks for that. Um, I'm just aware of time um, because we've been here for just shy of two hours, and it's been extremely valuable. Um, and um, I, I'm just to say that we have got uh, David Dovey wanted to ask a question. Did Councillor Easton, did you put your hand up to ask a question? So I guess what I've got, I've got David Dovey, then Tony Easton, Ruth Edwards uh, wanted to ask a question, and then uh, Louise Brown. Um, and may I ask you to, if you've got questions that have not already been asked, uh, and not to sort of just duplicate the questions. Um, well, what I'll do then, Ruth, if it's a very quick one, I'll go with you first, uh, and then um, Councillor David Dovey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. No, it's, it's not so much as a question. And then when you touched on chemotherapy at Chepstow, I know they've been doing it for a long time in Neville Hall. And so sort of north of the county, as it's very rural, they don't like having to go to Valinda unless that is where they have to have their treatment. But the biggest problem with Neville Hall is the parking. Um, very often, they've got to take somebody with them to drop them off to go somewhere else to park or drive around. And that is a big, big concern for anybody of excuse me, who has to have an outpatient's appointment in Neville Hall, is the parking. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I have to say, I came here today um, with the thought that I was going to be angry, if you like. As angry as I ever get, anyway. And and uh, but I I am um, re reassured in, in some ways that at least f again we have a, a plan for Chepstow, which on this occasion uh, doesn't seem so negative in that we're not going to be bacon sliced for um, of, of 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 services. So, Really, what I, what I want want to say is, is 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 to you guys, we want to believe in what you want to offer us. Um, and the the problem is that you have, and the one that drives us mad, is the fact that we have had successive plans brought to us, and this, um, uh, the bringing uh, health closer to the community. Uh, Dr. McDowell, is it that his name was? Um, came out and presented um, that to us. This is some years before um, a number of um, our, my colleagues have been here. Um, and it turned to, turned to nothing. Um, and then we had another plan come out, and we've had successive things come out. And every time it's been bacon slicing, what happens in Chepstow? And the public in Chepstow can see that. And uh, they, they are very, very angry about it. You have to bear in mind that the, the Ch hospital has um, a history. It had two hospitals there before. One of them was arguably the most professional and famous plastic hospital in the UK, definitely, probably in Europe and in the world. And uh, I have a thing about that because my mother worked as a theatre sister there for some time. So we, 
uh, people are used to having and are proud having, of having uh, a hospital service in Chepstow. But that has been taken away from them. They understand that. That moves on. But when we had the money to have a new hospital that was designed in such a way that it would service the local community, they bought into that in spades. And I, I can remember walking around the town with a bucket because there was no budget at that time for, the, for children's things in the school. And I thought of what could I call it, so I called it the Chuck It In The Bucket campaign for Chepstow Hospital. And we raised virtually all the money that was needed to put uh, uh, those sort of facilities in, into the hospital. What really what I'm saying to you is we want something that is really plain, simple, no smoke and mirrors. We don't want any fancy language. I, I, at the moment, I saw the beginning of your presentation with all the uh, lovely colors and whatnot. I, I, I was put off by that straight away. It's really a negative thing. You, you, this is a hard, hard, soul-searching subject for us in Chepstow. I could go on quite a, lot, a long way with this, but I'm not going to. People get bored with me. But I really, really am saying to you seriously, seriously, that you need to talk to us because we are the voice of the people. You need to have thought of what you say because if we say it's going to happen and it comes out through the council and whatnot, it makes the council and it makes us look stupid. It makes you look deceitful. And we don't want any more of the sort of practices where somebody comes to my committee and sits down and answers questions about Chepstow Hospital and what is going to happen to it and tells us point blank, and I asked him twice, was the, uh, was the, uh, the, was the clo closure a reality or not? And he said, no, it isn't going to close. And I found out the next day, in the free press, banner headlines, closure at Chepstow Hospital, and a quotation from him in it. And now that is the sort of reputation that you have got to overcome. Because at the moment, the public and I, and I suspect, People who have been at it, well, me, 13 years. I've seen all the changes. People oh, want it to be right this time. I'm sorry I've gone on, no, but no, I really I, I, want to paint I, yeah. the background for these good people. I, I guess um, you've of. made it very clear, and I have thank to say you, thank yeah. you for that passionate plea, and I, I think it is something that needed to be said. Um, and um, I'm just uh, concerned of the time, but uh, valuable um, observation and input. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor Dovey. Councillor Easton. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to be positive, not negative this time. Um, at the last meeting, um, there was a concern raised, and I thank Shan for the um, response. I phoned it next door eventually. Uh, the couple are getting on well. Um, I'd like a bit, a bit more information about the five surgeries in south of the county and the 47,000 um, capacity uh, patients, because I've been informed recently that there is a capacity issue in terms of doctors, but not in terms of surgeries, because we've got a lot of housing developments coming along on there, and I'd like a bit more uh, maybe not today, maybe later, on the depth of response and availability within the south of the county for this capacity issue. The third one, I think, is quite positive, is at Kaimar Road. Uh, it was going to be knocked down. It was going to be housing estate there. We are not anymore. And I would like local members in, this, in Caldecott to be kept briefed on, on that matter. Lisa Dimmock made a comment about the facilities available at Chepsel Hospital, which she wasn't aware of, and there's some which I'm not aware of. And you get the personal story now, I suppose, is the teledermatology unit. I didn't know it was there. Had it been there, it could have possibly saved me 14 days in having an operation. 
it took me a little bit of chivy in. My, my appointment would have been tomorrow, but a little bit of chivy in, I managed to get to see the dermatologist in Newport, and his whole job was done last Thursday. But had the ter- teledermatology unit been there, it would save a lot of people um, the, the, the need to go to Newport to see the dermatologist, etc., etc. So, as Council, as uh, Councillor Dimmock said, we need to have a little bit more information on what is really there in um, in Chepstow Hospital that's available to us. I, I understand what Councillor Devies said in terms of the fact that we felt we were let down previously. Well, we've got to move on. Whether you let down or not, we've got to move on. But we've got to need to know exactly what's there so we can use it with full potential so that we keep it. We don't want to lose it. And that particular one really caught, caught my eye because uh, the early part of August, I could have gone straight to Chepstow, had a picture taken, straight to the dermatologist, and, he, and what he said to me a week and a half ago was, it's got to come off, and within five days it was off. Could have done that a month ago. So not just me, but others who have similar problems, they've got the facilities there, but, but we don't know about it. The question I ask myself, and I'll ask the, ch- the practice manager of Caligot surgery this afternoon when I meet her at quarter two, do the doctors in Caligot know there's a de- uh, uh, teledermatology service there? So why did they, why was I referred to somebody else? I, I don't know. Um, I'd like some comments on, on, on what is in Chepstow generally. I'd like some comments on the capacity within the south of the county, where these five surgeries are, where these five, five surgeries, I can count four, but I can't count five. Um, and the fact that I know the ABUHB has been approached recently about a fairly large development in Caldecott, which ties around the capacity issue. Not the, not the facilities, but the capacity, the number of doctors you've got. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I can, I can answer a, a couple of those points. In terms of the um, medical services, GP practices in South Monmouthshire, the five practices are Caldecott Health Centre. There are three practices in Chepstow, Mount Pleasant, Towngate and Vauxhall and Tinton. Tinton. Yeah, why, why Dean? Is it why Dean? I think it is. Or why, yeah, why Dean? Um, the way that the... Um, services operate from the practices is dependent on their populations so as you know the practices are independent businesses um, and they are funded on a per patient basis so where um, there aren't any recruitment difficulties the money follows the patient so if there's a new housing development for example just for the sake of argument an additional 5,000 patients whatever it is the practice will be funded for those 5,000 patients and then they decide how best to spend the money to meet the needs of those patients. So they may decide that they want additional GP time, they may decide they want practice nurse time, they may decide they want, I don't know, buy-in occupational therapy time, whatever it might be. So from a health board perspective, in those practices where there isn't a recruitment difficulty at present, we wouldn't routinely object to housing developments purely from the point of view of the delivery of the primary care service because we know that they'll get the money and that they'll be able to recruit. And Monmouthshire, Sean would know a lot more about this and I know she said some about it already, Monmouthshire at the moment is not one of the key problem areas for the health board in terms of GP recruitment. That's not to say we haven't had recruitment difficulties but we aren't in a scenario where we've got managed GP practices because contracts have been handed back because the GPs can't sustain the service. So we are, I think, at pretty much full complement of GPs within Monmouthshire at the moment compared with with other parts of Gwent. Um, In terms of the the briefing of the councillors in Caldecott on an ongoing basis about the Kaimawa development, absolutely, we will make sure we do that. We are at the moment, as I said, in the very early stages of discussions about what it could be. But when, we're, when we've got a bit more information about what's possible, we'll certainly come out and, and talk to you about that. Thanks for that. Uh, final uh, question, small observation from uh, Councillor yeah, Brown. <laughs> Just very quickly, Chairman, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the issues is is that um, uh, obviously you've heard that... Um, 
you know, uh, Chepstow uh, area councillors have possibly a different view from those um, in the northern area because of the concern of what happened in relation to the uh, de dementia ward closing. I mean, there was a concern that community services have been stretched as a result because some pay a patient, for example, in, in Ebervale, they visit patients in the different hospitals and they didn't have to travel as far as Ebervale, so it's stretching circumstances there and obviously we've got the patchwork um, voluntary system of transport which isn't uh, ideal. I do agree very much with uh, what uh, Councillor Harris said in terms of and uh, Councillor Grucock in terms of treatment in the locality and I think it is having the right people in the right places. I'm very much in favour of the integrated uh, older adult community team and this, this, this idea. I think the point is, is that what, what I am concerned about is to make sure that the um, uh, practical normal health services aren't impacted by that building being, um, you know, that there needs to be a balance to make sure, for example, that the more outpatient uh, clinics and so forth, and, you know, hearing about further services on the um, uh, sort of primary health care side, um, you know, after all, it is a hospital and, um, you know, in a sense, um, it isn't, um, you know, you know, an in integrated care, care service. It hasn't got that heading. So people do expect general hospital services from there as well. As I say, I mean, if there was a different building for um, integrated uh, health or if, if there was basically a... Um, uh, you know wh whether or not there needs to be a, a little bit more balance between the two the two ideas. I think I think that's something that needs to be given further for thought because I know people in the Chepstow area are concerned about the um, primary health and the um, inpatient and outpatient services available. And care in the community includes some um, hospital beds as well as. Um, uh, as well as uh, outpatient services as well. And you do actually get support from the community more when a patient is actually based in a, in a local bed and their, their family and friends can visit them as opposed to when they're in Cardiff. And I think there was a mention, my concern is about the general trend about centralisation of hospital services and the operation that um, Councillor ha Harris men uh, mentioned in Cardiff will now only be done in uh, Swansea in terms of the they're, they're actually centralising it further so that there won't be uh, uh, Cardiff and Swansea available it'll be Swansea and again there's a problem about access to places. We're fortunate in the fact that we have cars and whatever but some people have to rely on public transport and we have to think about those people in terms of the services that we provided. So I'd be very much like you to come back to talk about the um, uh, generic side of um, healthcare in the area as well. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's been a very constructive, I think, uh, two hours. What I want to do is to try and just summarise uh, what people have been saying. And I've got a list of recommendations and just to check you're happy uh, with those um, because, it, as I say, it has been um, useful, very proactive. Uh, and thanks, uh, um, Sean, Bronwyn, um, Eve and uh, Julie uh, for answering uh, those questions. Um, just looking through the list then, uh, sort of, um, there's a theme um, uh, Councillor Brown brought up about uh, we do need to look at the generic picture and I think that's been brought up on, on uh, lots of people's wish lists if you like um, because um, we have to look at it in terms of including uh, across border issues and the impact that will have on the Chepstow Hospital. Um, the... Um, concern about centralisation of hospital services. Uh, I know we've got sort of the care in the community or the support in the community, but there is an element of uh, transport is a big issue. We're a rural authority uh, and um, Councillor Brown um, said it's a, a patchwork voluntary system of transport, so it's not all consistent and it, it is difficult. Um, Councillor Harris, uh, he highlighted and he felt strongly there is a general mess within the National Health Service. Uh, it is due to lack of money, but he didn't want to portion blame at this point. Um, but um, he was encouraged 
<laughs> he was encouraged by the presentation uh, and the integrated model uh, on, on the whole. Um, Councillor Pratt, uh, again, feeling that uh, the services are not really fit for purpose, uh, definitely a huge concern of the lack of uh, GPs um, and wanting that sort of um, point of contact. Uh, but obviously it opened out into a discussion of other professionals uh, that can deal with some of the issues and absolutely looking at, um, we need to look at um, tackling uh, the problems of obesity and that was a, a main concern there. Um, Councillor uh, Grocourt, balance, saying there needs to be a balance, overall uh, supportive of the integrated uh, model, but there needs to be a balance between bureaucracy and treatment. Um, and um, having a sense you're being passed from pillar to post and also a sense that there's a kind of a gap between the strategy and uh, the reality. So the vision that you're presenting and what's actually happening on the ground, there's, 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 there's a gap between that. Um, um, oh, Councillor Edwards um, definitely raised the concerns of rural communities, farming communities, and um, and would like to see a pilot uh, of having a clinic at the farmers market. And I've got that down as a recommendation when I go that, there. Also, she raised concerns about parking. So uh, Neville uh, Hall uh, parking is an issue. Um, Councillor Woodhouse quite rightly raised the importance of we need ways to measure success. So outcomes, and there's always that balance between the soft and hard outcomes. Hard outcomes numbers, dead easy, it's the soft outcomes. And I think we're very clear that any measurement needs to be useful to the person using the services and not, not anybody else who just wants to tick boxes. And I think that is definitely agreed right across the board. Um, in terms of consultation engagement, again, lots of people have said this. Um, Councillor Woodhouse suggested if you need to consult, please talk to us. We know where the groups are and we can link you in and, and you, uh, you um, highlight some of the voluntary groups and that's really important. Please use us for our uh, points of um, you know, uh, contact within the community. Um, she's also asked for a progress report on this. Again, it's down uh, uh, as, a, um, as a, an action point. Uh, Councillor Dimmick, she has gone now, but again, she raised... Uh, because we've been talking about older people, but obviously she was talking about young people and chronic illnesses, um, and her um, plea, I guess, to keep services local and accessible, because travelling when you've got a chronic illness is very, very stressful, and particularly when you have to do uh, regular visits. Um, Councillor Pavier, um, yes, again, it's been mentioned elsewhere, but need to develop more capacity in primary care, keeping people... Um, healthy and leading healthy lives. Um, he, on the whole, supports the integrated service model, but very strongly, and again, it was brought up, and, and um, Councillor Dovey made mention of it. Uh, there's the concerns that, although there's new services here, concerns that services have disappeared, and he provided a list, and one of them was the um, minor injuries unit. Um, he, he talked about keyhole surgery being a possibility to do that locally. Um, we, we had a discussion about the, the chemotherapy services. Um, and he, it's the waiting times again. This has come up with everybody talking about waiting times. If you have an x-ray and then you've got to wait four weeks before you can get a diagnosis and then how long before you get treatment. Uh, so this is a, a grave concern. Uh, and I know uh, Councillor Pratt had that concern as well. Partnership working. Um, I think we've all said this, and there's always been this debate, and I think having these sessions are really useful in terms of building up a relationship of trust and respect. But um, as Councillor Pavio was saying, he always feels that uh, local authorities will be the junior partner in this, and we don't want to be the junior partner. And I guess the element of that is the finance, how the finance is divvied out, because that relates to uh, kind of power balance in effect, um, but I, I think there is a sense that definitely on the ground level, um, in terms of relationships, there's trust and respect and true partnership working. I think it's more a strategic and financial element um, where we don't want our local services sucked into central control. Is that fair um, for that? Um, 
Okay, getting there, always want to make sure everybody's had their view. David Dovey has say, made, um, is, he's reassured, he's not angered anymore, but he does make a plea, he's just really concerned that he doesn't want any more bacon slicing, he, he, he called it, that um, there's a history of services just being sliced away, and again made a plea, which everybody has, please, uh, um, I suppose it's developing that relationship with residents so you can bring them along with your vision. Um, because it is a good vision, people are very positive about that vision, but it's a way of getting that across. Um, and again, Tony Easton uh, felt very positive about this. So, with that feedback, this is what we've achieved. So, the purpose was an update, and I think we've definitely had that update, definitely information we didn't have before. Uh, a couple of people mentioned it. Do you want us to recommend that this presentation, if Bromwyn and Sean are happy to come, should be um, delivered to all members, maybe at a full council or, or, or something like that? So happy for, for us to make that recommendation that this presentation goes to all members. So we put that down, fab. I don't need to vote on it, everybody's nodding. It's fine, isn't it? Um, okay, uh, one of the thoughts was to consider um, this report, and Councillor Woodhouse has uh, mentioned this, uh, this report coming back to us uh, to review progress uh, against the set outcomes. Six months, 12 months, what do you fancy? What do you think is useful? Six months, six months time, would that be feasible? I'm looking at the officers, is that yeah. feasible, do you think, yeah? yeah? Okay, so for this, so, um, so progress review in six months on this. Um, we are asking for a return visit again. You're going to be living with us, uh, um, I think. Um, but I think we're looking for a return visit to kind of open the discussion out a little bit more and looking more at the generic services and the future of national health services and the effect on, on Monmouthshire. And if we could invite the chief exec, Judith Paget. Uh, to come along as well. This might be in three, four months' time, but if we can get a date in the diary. Um, people happy with that? I'll just finish this now. Come back, uh, David. Um, yes, we would like to help you with the campaign on, um, on the pharmacies stuff. So if there's any way we can help, um, so again, if we can link with you somehow, and I think this is something that Roger Harris brought up, uh, use us, you know, to get that message out. Um, I'm intrigued to know what the 17 are. We could have a quiz, what the 17 are, with the prize of free ibuprofen or something. <laughs> Packet of ibuprofen if you get it right. Um, and exciting, uh, this looks exciting to me anyway, um, Councillor Edwards, pilot for Farmers Clinic, so that if we can put that down so we can just keep an eye on how that's developing. So that'll be brilliant. Um, and also um, maybe this could come in with the, with the generic um, uh, sort of uh, focus to include the new hospital, uh, Councillor Woodhouse, which is called... Oh, that's easy to pronounce then. <laughs> For Chepso as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, is everybody happy with that? That's a good set of recommendations and moving forward. So it's been a useful and we've been able to add value. Okay, I'm looking towards Councillor Dovey. Oh, sorry. In the chap, yeah, is that better? Yes. Yeah. M most people don't say yes, yes when I'm talking, they don't at all. Uh, what we're ha experiencing in, in Jepstow is uh, a, a big explosion in applications for housing. And indeed, uh, it, is, it, it is just across the border as well in, um, in, in Gloucestershire. And people uh, treat that area of Gloucestershire and Chepstow almost as one. Chepstow is the town for Sedbury and whatnot. So you've, you've got at the moment, for instance, in Sedbury going up about uh, 400 houses there. 
um, and that is likely to grow as well. You've got within my ward a growth of housing, which is being developed at the moment. So uh, uh, how, really what I'm just saying, do you have an eye for the future and how do you access that information? Do you ask us what's going on? You know, because it's important for you. Yeah, I, I, I can answer that. Yes, we do know about it. There are two mechanisms that operate. The first one being that any specific requests for housing um, are directed through the neighbourhood care networks so that when there is a specific plan, the Caldicott one recently being an example mm. of that, the neighbourhood care network are formally notified by the local authority and we take that request to the meeting so it, the GPs are aware of it, as are the rest of the health board. Mm. But on a more long-term level, we're obviously part of the, um, the planning processes that are done on behalf of the Public Services Board around the future demographics and where services are likely to be needed in the future. And we are in the early stages of discussions with Mark Hand from the planning team here about actually being part of the development plan side of things. So when the LDP is... Um, produced we'll, we we do receive it for consultation but this time we're looking to take a more active role in that so yes we are we are involved in, in that. brilliant thank thanks for that um uh, councillor edwards is chair of planning so that's nods of head so pleased with that yeah. I, the, all i was going to say chair is if when you speak to mark um you, you want to find out how you could get the information from just across the border as well because that won't come as an thank, thanks for thank that. You, Chairman. Um, well, thank you very, very much. I just want to clarify one <coughs> point. My <coughs> vice chair just wanted total clarification on one of the visits uh, return. When we're looking at the generic service, we're having general service, but with a particular reference to Chepstow and the new hospital. <coughs> just so that we're, but but we will be emailing you with an invite. So. Um, I think on that, thank you very, very much. It has been really useful. I think we have got some action points there. Um, what I suggest we do is have a comfort break, five minutes, and then come back. And Phil Diamond, um, who's been sitting there so very patiently, uh, and we look forward to hearing uh, your report. And we've, we've got a copy of the report. And I think the discussions today kind of helps with that report as well. Five minutes, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. Paul, what report is he coming up with? Phil? Is it worth me staying for that?
because the majority of you are back, I, I just want to ask a question, really, um, because this morning went on longer than we had predicted, but it was it was good stuff, and, and we had to get all those questions in. Um, Mark has offered that um, possibly deferring um, the revenue and capital monitoring statement to the next meeting, bearing in mind it's early on, it's only in the two, three... Um, months and we are on an underspend within we're on an underspend within our portfolio at the minute so are are we happy to defer that one can i just ask mark if there's anything that he's particularly concerned about at the moment Yeah, apologies for uh, for creating that volatility. I explained to the chair that actually, in relation to the specific portfolio of the adult committee, there's not that much of significant volatility for you to consider. In your role as general members, I'd always encourage you to have a look at those papers because it'll give you a wider understanding of the council more generally. Yeah, but uh, from revenue perspectives capital there's very little capital program spent on the adult budget and it's only an update to the electrical works that will be afforded by property maintenance revenue wise collectively across adult community care and commissioning you're in a net 174k underspend at the moment so uh, please look at period two if you would but uh, I don't, I'd encourage all of you to have a look at the general report particularly those of you that hold a governorship at school because there are some quite significant changes around school reserves so are, 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 are we in one accord in deferring it yeah yeah, yeah. 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 fab thanks Yeah. Right, thanks for that then. Um, so the next agenda item is the Dementia Friendly Community um, Report. Uh, again, this has come to us on our request. It's a progress update. Um, and I will, uh, we have got a copy in front of us, we've had it in advance to look at. Um, so if I look uh, towards uh, Phil Diamond, um, to just get some, a few highlights and a few areas possibly of concern that you want to draw to our attention and then we'll have questions, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I won't um, uh, take too long, hopefully. Uh, you've all ha received copies of the report, so uh, I was just going to sort of uh, focus on some of the headlines. Uh, in terms of Monmouthshire, uh, the council, it was um, accredited as dementia-friendly communities, or dementia-friendly, sorry, uh, back in the summer of last year. And what that means is that the local authority had met seven criteria set by the Alzheimer's Society. However, Monmouthshire Authority, uh, sorry, Monmouthshire Borough is also a dementia-friendly borough. And I think the key words here are working towards it recognises that the, the task will never, ever be complete. There's always ways that we can improve uh, care, our support and understanding. So uh, the report is set uh, out across the seven criteria, and uh, as I mentioned, I'm not going to go through all of them in depth. I think some of the key headlines for us uh, to sort of note is that uh, since we've uh, started this journey, nearly 2,000 people have received the Dementia Friends Awareness, and it's great, I know some people are wearing their Dementia Friends badges today. That is the sort of um, uh, general awareness of what dementia is, the five key messages, and what life is like. And uh, although it's important for professionals and people uh, making decisions, whether it's in relation to services and budgets, etc., the greatest feedback I have from uh, delivery of uh, the sessions is how useful it is for carers. And I think that's something of a different slant uh, that, uh, from the conversation and the discussions this morning. And we all know the huge role that carers take. So, uh, for instance, um, in, in terms of going forward, the Dementia Friends uh, Awareness will look into roll this out right across the whole of the borough, the uh, whole of the services. That's no mean feat. Uh, and something very exciting that we're working on with some of the uh, social care workforce colleagues is to develop an online training. Now, you'd think Dementia Friends would be online, considering this is a UK initiative, but it's not. 
and uh, we're looking to develop uh, an online resource here in Monmouthshire that we could roll out right across the other four boroughs, if not Wales, even the UK, I, I feel that there's a need for it. So uh, that's something that we'll be working on, uh, and that will hopefully increase the um, uptake of the Dementia Friends Awareness. Uh, our work with schools, it has started uh, right across Gwent, and we have some good links in schools here. Uh, however, going forward, there will be a real emphasis this year on um, some of the schools, and so we're looking to actually accredit some of our first schools here in Monmouthshire. Uh, in terms of the other businesses we've been working with, Gwent Police, Fire Services, the Blue Light Services, uh, supermarkets, um, uh, sort of uh, banks, etc. And I'll just make a very quick anecdote. You know, what's good for the body is good for the mind. And uh, in terms of people with dementia, when they, people we uh, receive that diagnosis, they become very embarrassed. Um, by this diagnosis and feel that they cannot now carry on living their life and what have you. And that actually, if the brain is a sort of a muscle, the more we use it, the, you know, um, the stronger it is. But also, if we don't use it, we lose it. And actually, for someone, uh, uh, someone uh, who had a diagnosis was speaking to me and saying they had the diagnosis and they were afraid to leave the house. Uh, their husband worked a shift pattern and they wouldn't leave the house until two o'clock in the afternoon when their husband came home. And her conditions deteriorated because she was literally st you know, stuck in a room looking at the ceiling and what have you. So actually part of this is actually encouraging people to live their life, uh, whether they're living with dementia, is to encourage people to, to go out and to visit the market, to visit shops, to visit banks, because that's actually keeping people strong and it's slowing down that rate of progression. And, and I think that's a big feature. It, which chimes with the earlier conversations around early intervention. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the challenges going forward, or sort of, I guess, the next steps, we're looking to work with the Leisure Trust. Uh, the Leisure Trust will be um, in the Chepstow, actually, will be uh, developing uh, a link with the GP surgeries, and we'll be looking at um, sort of keep fit messages. But there will be a 10-week programme for people at that point of diagnosis where they will have access to a variety of different ac activities and dis um, sort of presentations, whether that's um, financial, whether that's legal, or whether that's ac actually keeping fit. Uh, so I think I'd finish there, actually, because uh, you've got the report, and I did promise I wouldn't speak for too much, too long. Oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. It's, it's, re you, it's kind of helpful to have the green bits and the red bits, because mm -hmm. all the kind of day-to-day -day stuff, it, it just carries on, so that's really helpful. Sort of questions. Um, Councillor um, Grawcutt. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, one question and, and one um, pedant point. Uh, the report talks about Monmouthshire County Borough Council. Uh, we are a county council. Uh, the other four unitaries that came out of Gwent are county boroughs, but, but we are not. Uh, but the question is, is that I was looking at the, the table of training that you've been providing over recent years, and I noticed that in 2017-18 it seemed to tail off significantly. Is that because the work is done or because of cuts or, or what? No, I mean, it is up and down, and a certain sense of the, the Dementia Friends Awareness is where we push on open doors as well. So it's as much about us raising awareness. However, I think we're quite pleased in terms of the targets that we've set. We've more than sort of achieved them. And it's not about making this about numbers, uh, you know, targets, etc. But, uh, you, you know, it is, it has... Um, surpass our expectations and right across Wales and the UK actually there was a, there was a Welsh target of um, I think nearly about a million people to sort of uh, uh, become dementia friends and we're more than uh, hitting that and in fact the target for the UK was for two million to be achieved by uh, 2020 now it's actually been raised to four million so uh, in terms of the, the message, it is getting out there. However, like I said at the beginning, it's working towards we can never, ever become complacent and say, yes, we've got 2,000 people, that's not enough. We, our intention is, is for every single person. Because every single person is likely to be touched by dementia mm -hmm. at some point, and that's why we feel every single person should have that bit of understanding. Thanks for that. It's a little bit like the safeguarding children sort of uh, method. And um, thanks for raising the issue over the name of Monmouthshire. It does prove that you actually read the stuff, so that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Chair. And I, yes, I did read the report. But, um, 
but also there was uh, an article in the paper I picked up this week, and I know we're very keen to label everything. You know, got ADHD, not a naughty child anymore. We've got a label for everything. And this one particular person um, was told she'd got dementia, but actually she'd got a hearing problem. So it's surprising how many people could be di misdiagnosed then through other things and be labeled, oh, you know, to become senile or got dementia. So I think we have to be very careful about how we pigeonhole, you know, different people with different ailments. I'd just like to come in there because actually I think that's a, a really um, good point and actually shows you that training has to definitely go throughout the um, medical profession because um, I, I think social care have really sort of got that on board but it's absolutely everybody in the medical profession as well. Um, Councillor Woodhouse. Thank you, Chair. Can I say what a fantastic work you're doing? Because I've had some involvement with the Alzheimer's Society in Abergavenny, and I know there's an awful lot of work is, is, is being carried out. You, you're doing it in partnership with it, all the various um, organisations. But it's, it's also very heartening to hear that um, you're starting to work with schools. Um, I think that is really important that young people understand it. The, you know... The, They've got grandparents, perhaps, who are affected by it, younger children, and, and that understanding. I know I've spoken to young people who have sort of benefited from understand, the, the understanding of it. Um, what's going through my mind is, do you build in refresher courses for people? Because, I mean, I know it's important to understand, but things change constantly, and diagnosis change different aspects of, of, um, of this. I just wondered, if, of dementia, I just wondered if you have sort of any plans for refresher courses, but... Yes, I, I'm sort of encouraging anybody I know to, to get involved, to be trained, because it is something really important. Some of the, 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 the sort of scenarios that you give us when we're trained is uh, absolutely enlight really enlightening, so thank you. Yes, um, the Welsh Government uh, recently launched a sort of a learning and development framework called Good Works, and that's based on um, research uh, with Swansea University. Uh, a guy called uh, Nick Andrews, who's a leading light on this. And uh, what we're now looking to do is to take that forward regionally. And part of that will be uh, a good practice, a sharing event, a refreshing, is for people to share stories and practice as well. And that's actually going to sort of be embedded. But in terms of dementia friends, yes, I mean, I delivered a session yesterday to Torvan councillors, and there was a few people in there who'd received the training. And they said exactly the same, that, you know, it was useful just to come for a refresher. And what maybe we could look at is maybe different um, uh, champions delivering the training. Because we all come with a slightly different, slightly different anecdotes and stories and what have you. But uh, yeah, that's maybe something that we can come back to the, this uh, chamber and do in the future. And maybe with a few updates and stories. Yeah, I think that's a good suggestion. I'll take that back. But in terms of the schools, what I will say, um, we're also linking to, looking to link with um, uh, students around the Welsh Baccalaureate in terms of the volunteering aspect of the qualification and link them around the intergenerational work. And Gwent was, the, um, I believe, we're one of the first health boards to have an intergenerational strategy, and uh, there will be um, hopefully a, a large amount of work going forward. But also uh, we've... An intergenerational choir. An intergenerational <laughs> choir, yes. Uh, the, you, you know, there's lots of uh, different work, but we've also developed a storybook as well for some of the younger pupils. Um, and that's there's an ICF bid, Integrated Care Fund, that's gone forward recently for that book to be distributed to every single school across Gwent. So that'll be every school in Monmouthshire, Torvine, to receive that. Thanks. I've lost the plot now. Uh, Councillor um, Brown and then Councillor Pavia. Um, very, very interesting to, to read the report and the different um, organisations that you've been out to. And I noticed that included um, a supermarket as well. Um, do you think it's, and then there's a list of um, partner actions. I mean, obviously, it would be good to see those that list expand in a sense. But also, um, you know, for obviously in relation to supermarkets, it's something that um, people use on a daily basis. And to get understanding there is, um, is, is very helpful as well. And I just wondered, um, you know, in the sense how they have... Um, sort of school champions and thing, things like that, whether or not um, uh, the supermarkets themselves would 
take on that role of telling other supermarkets about it because obviously um, there's just one that's been mentioned there and you know obviously there are other supermarket major supermarkets in the area and it's um, to develop an under understanding but I also think it's um, approaching it from the point of view of what people can do as opposed to what they can't do because um, uh, I, I regularly um, go along to a singing for fun group in the um, Chepstow Methodist on a Wednesday morning, which is basically, it's to do with, um, uh, you know, si singing well-known songs. And, you know, there's a great deal of enjoyment out of that. But uh, well, I was interested to hear that um, one of the um, uh, wives of um, a husband who has dementia was also saying that he joined in on, on table tennis. And I said, well, I'm surprised at that. And she said, well, it's sort of like a natural reaction in the same sense that you know throwing a ball at somebody they naturally go to to catch it and you know if you can capture on those sort of type of activities actually beyond what you think um you know um people could necessarily get involved in you know i mean i'm sure there will be you know enjoyment arising out of activities that weren't necessarily thought about before thank you And just to say, yeah, about the supermarkets, we're definitely keen to work with a lot more. Uh, we do have the mandate, actually, because uh, all of the supermarket chains have agreed to um, become dementia-friendly at a sort of um, headquarters level, yeah. you know, and in London, you know, where the majority of the headquarters are. Uh, it's just about pushing on open doors. I mean, we have contacted them and we are chasing them. We, we were in Tesco's recently. Uh, in Newport, so once we can go into Tesla's Newport, we can then say, well, look, we can move out to other branches. And uh, I guess it, the demand has been, um, you know, so great by other organisations and businesses who want to sort of uh, rush us in that we've not been able to chase the others in a sense because we say, well, actually, Momshire Building Society want us to deliver all staff. So every Momshire Building Society in in um, uh, South Wales have had this, the training, so they're missing out. But yes, they're still on our list and uh, they're still there for us to sort of take forward the work. And uh, in terms of the activities, yes, and I think that's an um, exciting piece of work that's coming forward from Monmouthshire and Dr Andy Gray. So uh, I'll feed back that and hopefully it'll be in the next report. But there's definitely a 10 week programme on exercise uh, and whether Zumba and things like that will be part of it. Thanks for that. Um, Councillor Pavia. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. Thanks, Phil, for the report. Um, I just, I've got a feel of, of, of what's going on further in the south of the county, particularly in, in and around Chepstow, and, and what um, partnerships are, are being either broached or, or facilitated with, with groups like the um, Senior Citizens Welfare Trust at, at uh, Palmer Send, which is uh, a crucial hub for us uh, in, in Chepstow. Um, so I, I, you did touch on um, a further rollout of, uh, of a service within within um, uh, Chapter Leisure Centre, so I'd be interested just to just get a little bit of a flavour of that. Thanks. We, I would certainly welcome a link with the uh, senior uh, citizens uh, group. Uh, I've delivered and worked with 50 plus forums right across, uh, you know, the five authorities, and uh, you know, as I, as mentioned, uh, it's just who get in touch with us really in one sense because uh, some of this uh, we don't have to sell we you know we, we deliver a presentation and there's four or five other organizations we need this but uh, yeah we would certainly be willing to um, uh, deliver a dementia friend session uh, i've delivered one or two sessions down in in um, as part of um, the aging well executive groups etc so if you could forward me that link that would be great and just another exciting development in chepstow uh, we are now looking to accredit GP surgeries as dementia friendly and carer friendly and uh, that's just a couple of simple steps and criteria you know have all the staff in a GP surgery including the receptionist receive the dementia friends awareness do we regularly display information uh, around how we keep uh, reduce our own risk of dementia etc etc and that's going to be sort of um, piloted in the Chepstow area as well and that's a, and if we get that kite mark we'll again roll that up right across Gwent. Um, it's a, a, a thorough report an easy read report which we always like mm -hmm. um, and we've had a few questions but I think the 
lack of questions might be because it's such a good report, to be honest with you. Yeah, everybody happy with that? Um, again, just very brief uh, summary then. Um, um, I, I think when talking about the training, I think the majority of people are sort of saying um, the training, put your hands up if you have been on the training. I have not been on the fab, yeah. Um, so those who have been on the training are saying it's, it's amazing, it's high quality. Um, I think it uh, touches the soul as well as the brain, I think, uh, the, the training that's delivered. Um, and um, there is an element of perhaps encouraging all members, and would it not be good if we had a recommendation that uh, all members of Monmouthshire County Council attend the training at some point? Somebody's writing a note there, do you want to be aware of that? Yeah, yeah. So we'll try and find a slot uh, to to hit max audience, really. So if we put that down as one recommendation, that we try and encourage all members uh, to take up that that training, and that hopefully will kind of support you uh, in what you're doing. Um, I think generally, again, they're saying please use us and our contacts. Uh, and and uh, Councillor Pavio uh, uh, sort of mentioned a group um, where we can kind of pull you in uh, to d d deliver training <coughs> in our area, in our wards. Um, I was just looking at the other... Um, uh, how can we support raise awareness? Um, in terms of another <coughs> progress report, I think that's something we need to look at because it's constant development. Uh, because as you were saying, we're never going to be there, so it's just always ongoing. Um, if we, ha I'm not really sure what was the gap between the last report because um, I'm thinking maybe 12 months, maybe even 18 months. I don't know. What? What? Yep. Yeah. The report is the annual report which is stipulated by Alzheimer's Society. So, so at least every year we have to report. So, um, Okay, so if we bring it back in a year's time, that'd be brilliant. Um, and I guess the purpose of this really was for us to look at the report and hear what was going on to, to feel confident that we're actually on track and we're making progress against the criteria. Are you confident that we're on track? Put your hand up if you think you're confident and you have no concerns at this stage. Nobody's putting their hands up. Put, put your hand up <laughs> if you feel confident that we're on progress um, and we're making steady progress and you have no major concerns over this work. Yep. I guess we just want to sort of say we're, we're happy with the report and then we continue to support it, yeah. But there isn't, there isn't anything, yeah, yeah. So thanks, one, Phil, for sitting through the whole of this morning as well. That shows tenacity and commitment. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And, and hopefully you found the discussions useful anyway. And yes, I think members are saying, you know, if you need any help, uh, contact us. And my vow is that, you know, when there's training coming up, I will definitely do that training. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, just as a reminder, because a couple of people weren't here, because of the pressures of time, um, we've decided to defer the revenue and capital monitoring uh, because the, the, there wasn't any major issues and it's still quite early. Uh, it's only kind of three, three months into the budget, really. Um, so we're going to defer that and everybody agreed on, on doing that. Okay, so the next uh, item on the agenda then... First of all, if I could just um, confirm and sign the minutes, and I'm only looking for accuracy at this point uh, to pass them. Um, so I'm looking at Adult Select Committee on the 10th of July. Would it, any, yep, so. I'll so, move those. Okay, well, Ruth put her hand up first, so if I put, uh, no, no, that's fine. So Ruth Edwards moves and uh, se second by uh, Martin uh, Grocutt. Mm -hmm. Happy with that? And again, for uh, accuracy, the special meeting that we had on the 19th of July, 
Um, we've got Paul Pavier, who is moving. No, I'm not, no I'm not he's moving. not moving no, to us. Sorry, question, questions on that. You. Thanks. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling down. And it was just in relation to the, um, the, the vote that was taken at the end. I know it was only a notional vote. Um, but the, 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 I don't think the numbers are right, are they? So, they seem very low, don't they? Because yeah. there's like four votes going yeah. on there. To some degree, I would like that removed in a way because it is just a notional and it, it actually carried no weight. Or do you want the figures to be there? I don't know. I, sorry, I wasn't at that meeting, but when I read the minutes and I saw that, I thought, does this mean people had left before the vote? Or yeah, I just wondered why the numbers were so low. It does look rather strange. Is there a way of, um, of sort of re reviewing the um, the the record uh, record of evidence? VCR, have we got a VCR on that? Can we <laughs> go back and have a look? Committee members. Yes. So, for example, today, yes. Councillor Dovey and Councillor Eason, though they were present in the chamber, they wouldn't have been able to vote on anything. Give, yeah. you know, if there was yeah. a vote today. Okay. So we'll certainly review I, I'm, the Yeah, footage. I'm sure there was more than members there than there than, than, than that, though. I think what we'll do is we'll double-check those figures, but I think we need to put something in there because, to some degree, those that vote doesn't carry any weight. It was just to get a feel, I think, of what, where people were at. But, yes, let, let's try and get a more accurate uh, number. Yeah. And I think you're right to some degree. It's kind of a bit of a, a, a reflection on that. We had a lot of people here because we invited all members. But yes, the voting is just the remaining committee members. So that might be why that's reflected. Councillor Harris. Just to say, uh, Chair, it's in the uh, minutes. If four was a quorum, that has to be a valid vote. Oh, it would be valid. Yeah. I think, I think the, the you know, it can't be discounted. That's what I'm saying. I think the point that Council Pavia was making that it just seemed low on numbers as opposed to the validity. Um, obviously, it would stand. And as I said, as clerk and scrutiny, now we'll check yeah. to see. Obviously, we won't be able to see who physically voted because the camera would be on the chair proposing the vote. But at least we will be able to see how many members of the committee were in the chamber at the time. As I said, if it was like today with Eason and Dovey, even though they were physically here, they wouldn't have been counted in the numbers, and that may be the case with this. So we will double check and let you know, okay? I wasn't actually at the meeting, but I did watch the recording afterwards, and um, I think um, I haven't got the section of the minutes in front of me, but it may be worthwhile adding a sentence to say only, if it doesn't already, that only members of the committee could vote or something. That, that may be a good idea, because obviously when people are reading in, it kind of looks a bit sad, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, are you happy with that, um, Councillor Pavier? Um, so with that amendment, are people happy to vote for the accuracy of, of the minutes? Anybody want to? So, um, no, Ruth Edwards was hand up first, uh, followed by uh, Roger Harris to se second that. Yeah, happy. Yeah, OK, thanks. Um, what I would like to do, now that they've been passed as accurate, um, if you can indulge, I want to just very quickly uh, just flick through the two sets of minutes because um, there are shaded areas where there's a summary of um, members' comments and any action points, recommendations. And I'm just going to quickly look through where there's actions to make sure they have been um, transferred into the action list so that action list is up to date is that all right so if i read them out who's kind of just checking they're there is that all right um just because um what i really don't want is us making recommendations and it just gets lost in the ether or, or kicked in the long grass okay so i'm just literally going page by page so uh, on page five of the first set of um, minutes I'm just looking at that conclusion. There's not an action there. 
uh, on page six. So we've got here. Um, just want to double check that the B and B policy that we've uh, included to be reviewed annually. That we've yeah. kind of linked that in. Um, that there was a suggestion, I think it might have been Councillor uh, Brown, that housing department liaises with churches to establish areas of joint working. Just to check that's kind of gone across. Um, that, that's on page six of the first set of, of, of minutes. Yeah. Um, in the chair summary, the shaded area. Um, also, this counts, uh, county councillors, Jane Pratt, uh, Louise Brown, and Sarah Woodhouse, Sheila Woodhouse, I don't know who Sarah is, Sheila Woodhouse, sorry about that, uh, to spend a day in the office with the housing staff. Um, fab, well, is that, in with the, is that in with the action list so we can get an update on that? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Page six of the bun of the um, the actual first set of minutes. Right, chairs actually reading from the chair summary on the set of minutes from the tenth of July. Yeah. Item six in the, in the highlighted box at the end of item six. Question anything. I'm, I'm just making sure that it's got here um, that uh, paragraph 2.4 to the recommendation of report, um, namely that B and B policy also be reviewed annually, and that um, the housing department liaises with with uh, churches. It's in the it's in the first set of meetings minutes, so it's in the minutes of July, 10th of July. And of those minutes, it's on page six. Yeah, I can see it. Is that fine? Okay. The 10th of July. I mean, this is stuff I should have done beforehand, so. Right. Yeah, so just make sure they are in the, right, okay, moving on, moving on. Okay, I'm just going to, to be honest, this is something as chair I should really do prior to this meeting. Um, and in future, that's what I'm going to do. But at the, this point, I just want to make sure we're not missing anything. Um, we've got here, um, th review the website. So again, yeah, just in terms of an action. Um, yeah. uh, uh, there was definitely raises of lack of affordable housing, and that was dealt with the LDP discussion. A report to be presented to future select committee meeting on the private stock housing policy. Yeah. So that's, that's linked in with the action and then coming fab. I say just want to, sorry about this guys. Um, committee's conclusion on this, the future performance reports receives figures, needs also to have the cohort figures alongside it to provide context. So hopefully that recommendation went through to future reports. Uh, well, exactly. That's why I'm, I'm saying it again, to make sure that we don't have to keep asking for it. Um, oh, this one, it, I'm not sure it's in the actions, and it's, it links in with uh, Councillor Pavier um, with the economy and development, and it's that uh, the Assistant Head of Finance to liaise with the Welsh Local Government Association regarding inviting somebody over so that we can question, scrutinise um, uh, local government funding formula. And um, if that's in the action, it's yeah. just to see where we're, we're with. Yeah, I just want to see where we're with, where we are with that. Um, do, 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 and I think that'll be fine because the other requests are in the recommendations from the previous uh, meeting. Okay, then. So I'm now moving on to agenda item seven, which is the action list. So let's have a look at that. Um, so, um, yeah, feedback, I guess, from um, either Councillor Woodhouse or um, Councillor Brown, because um, you met with the office staff, or you're going to tomorrow, did you say? Oh, yep. Yeah, Chair, there was also the issue with regard to um, Councillor Pratt and I um, saw officers about the um, uh, personal data issue. 
and I've, I've actually got a, a short report, if you want me to read it back, that's be, been agreed with Councillor Pratt, because <coughs> uh, there's a recommendation for the committee to consider further action as a result. Okay, thank you. Um, that's great. So meeting tomorrow and then feedback at the next meeting would be brilliant. Yeah, we, we'll add that to to the the to the um, agenda. Um, leaflets. There was some back and forward. I think with uh, Ian Bakewell about leaflets. Um, and again, I think you were involved with that. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think we were we were sent copies of um, drafts, and um, but I'm not sure. Um, whether they've been distributed yet or not. Are they um, well, I said that that was fine, but I don't know whether the chair had a chance to have a look. Actually, do you want to do this bit? I'm going to give it. Uh, Delegation. <laughs> right. Sorry, as far as um, the summaries that I know have been requested by a number of uh, our councillors, um, that's definitely something that they're looking at at the moment. Uh, Democratic Services and a number of the policy officers are looking to make all reports more jargon-free and acronym-free. And like I said, just give a little synopsis at the, at the beginning of the report, which is more of an idiot's guide. So at a glance, if you had no history of the subject matter, you, you would get your bearings yeah. as far as where, where the report was going. The so the absolutely. Don't want to see the report I don't know what they're absolutely. About. Yeah, yeah. And as far as the revenue and monitoring, obviously they've been uh, deferred to the next item, uh, next meeting rather, because of uh, time constraints today. But you know yourselves, budgets is something that comes reg regularly. And as of the next month or so, we will be doing budget scrutiny through Select. So that's always something to look forward to. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, are people happy to just have a quick feedback from Councillor Brown um, on the data stuff, or would you want to have it actually on the agenda for next agenda? I think bring it as agenda just because I think it'll get lost. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea because we're, we're getting near the end of the meeting, aren't we? And. Um, you know, we did. Ag I did agree a, a joint report with Councillor Pratt, and she's obviously not here at the moment. So, okay. I, I think that would be better because then we can look at it in more more depth. Yeah, that's something obviously we can look at add into the work program. I can liaise with Councillor Brown and Councillor Pratt on those items, um, and as quite rightly, Councillor Harris just said, obviously he needs the background and the information on it. And as we're barely core at now, yeah. <laughs> I think it's best to bring it fresh to a straight, uh, to the next meeting or a very soon meeting. Um, what I will say in response to Council Pavia's query, um, we've just reviewed the footage of the special meeting back in July. And when the vote was taken, there was four members of the committee in attendance and three non-members of the committee in um, right, attendance. Yeah, yeah. So that maybe where the confusion is obviously wendy is happy to add something along the lines of non-committee members are not eligible to vote so that if someone who would you know hasn't sat down and read the constitution as if mm. um <laughs> would see at a glance that obviously it wasn't a case of um miscounting or disinterest it is simply a case of committee members are the only ones to have, to vote in those situations with, with with this with the you know this sort of topic and um future topics equivalent especially when we're looking at um the health board services making it a joint select because obviously there are a lot of members yeah. people here today who aren't members of the committee and they were at that that particular meeting so if we could even open it up to all members but just to, to make sure that uh, it has a wider range okay um yep an excellent um suggestion what i will say is that all members get copies of agendas and you know they 
all members are available to come to all meetings. So obviously I, I get the point about um, the invitation, but any member is available to come it to any meeting if there's anything on the subject matter of the agendas, hopefully which they read um, and come along to. But um, we'll, we'll certainly, you know, bear that in mind for the, when they return. Um, moving on to the next uh, agenda item, um, looking at forward work programme. Um, I think today, I think less is more. Um, I, I am aware there's a lot of reports, a lot of reviews, um, and <laughs> I will quote again, Paula, this is not an area to have a show and tell. It's got to be something that we can add value to um, because time is precious. Uh, for officers and for us, um, and it's about having things on the work programme that we are, you know, strategic things that we want or policy changes that we want to move forward and, as I say, add value to. Um, even from this meeting, there's, there's an awful lot going ahead for the work programme, I think. Um, so with that in mind, um, is there any sort of issue or area of interest that you think is really important to make sure is on the work programme for this year? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, there's the agenda items already for the um, 23rd of October, and we've added um, uh, the revenue one, which has been uh, deferred. But it would be useful um, if we had um, sort of a, a report back, um, not only in relation to the personal data issue, but obviously our, our day shadowing, um, um, if, if uh, Councillor uh, Woodhouse agrees with that, our day shadowing, um, uh, you know, just for some general feedback. If you're happy with that, are you? Or, yeah. Um, as it stands, the 23rd of October is incredibly busy. Yeah. And as Councillor Brakeburn rightly said, it's about the quality of the scrutiny. Yeah, um, yeah. Traditionally, we've tried to make the agendas three items. Um, and obviously, with some items, they are worthy of longer scrutiny than others. And there's more questions to be raised on certain subjects than something that simply comes here for an update. So I think we'll have to have a look at the work programme. I guess in in the light of it's not a show and tell, I guess I'm questioning why my mate's programme was put on the agenda. It's brilliant programme, it's working well, it's very interesting, but do we need to scrutinise it? Over to you. Um, again, that comes to um, Adult Select as more of a update performance monitoring item. So although it doesn't necessarily come to the next meeting, um, perhaps if we have a quieter session, certainly bring that along. Next month's meeting is more um, about a lot of social housing items, yeah. which um, conveniently have come at the same time. So, I mean, that's married together really well. As I said, if we're looking at other items, we may well need to call a special. There will be a special for the budget monitoring, uh, budget scrutiny rather, which will be no doubt scrutinised as separate committees and a joint committee. So we'll certainly look at your calendars before making any decisions. Going back to the report from tomorrow's um, shadow day, we're going to shadow the housing team. Could we just put together a report which is circulated with the agenda for the next meeting and leave it to this meeting then, that meeting then, to decide whether or not they want to put on the agenda for the following meeting? It could just be it's information passing as opposed to being scrutinised. Yeah. Okay. And we leave it for the committee to decide if they want to take it further. The very thing with Julie Boothroyd's report as well. Let us have it. Uh, in, 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 in writing and if there's loads of questions that come out initially then in the uh, pre-meeting we can decide that that will uh, go to another meeting we don't even have to go into the full meeting for that 
Sorry, I think we've already agreed in, in any event that we can do a short report back on the, because we obviously, we've missed it today. Um, yeah, so I mean, that, that won't take a great deal of time. And I, I, I appreciate the point that uh, Councillor Harris has made, because if the My Mates initiative is more of a, uh, an information report as opposed to a scrutiny report, then obviously there is the difference between the two, isn't it? Because yeah, it, right. it, it actually says it's a, an update as opposed to, which suggests it's an information report, but we won't know till we actually see it. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, where are we now? Gosh, I haven't had a coffee in between. I didn't have that comfort break, you see. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I okay. sat here waiting. So, uh, work program. The Council and Cabinet Business Forward Work Program, uh, was there anything from that? I whizzed through it uh, to see if anything uh, was coming up in the future that was not included in our scrutiny, and I couldn't see anything jumping out at me. I don't know what your thoughts are. Again, with this item, um, obviously you get your updates every Friday from Democratic Services in regard to things that have been updated or added. Uh, it's just a case of keeping your eye on something that um, you think needs to come to scrutiny. And if so, either contact myself, Hazel, or the Chair. Or if you're unhappy with a Cabinet decision, you can always have a call in. Um, so that leaves us now at the end. Uh, the next meeting then is on Tuesday the 23rd of October at, at 10 o'clock. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, the last people standing. <laughs>